Hello, everybody. Um, my name is, as I suggest here, Milind Mahajan. I am an associate professor in genetics and genomics. And then I also run the genomics facility here at Mount Sinai. Uh, just to give a two minutes introduction about this facility, we started building this facility in 2011 uh, with an intention to uh, create a hub for the genome technologies and then, uh, and then start a development of a genomic medicine at Mount Sinai. Okay. And, and then today what I'll do is, because in this um, uh, summer program, I think that you are all uh, going to understand, learn about the um, analysis of the, um, the sequencing data, right, mostly. Uh, but what we'll do is how to understand the technologies in general, other than sequencing, and then mostly we'll emphasize on sequencing, but other technologies too. The need for the development of technologies, how we did that, and then how we develop those, that data that you analyze or the people analyze. Right at the click of a button, uh, people analyze that data and then um, how we got there, what is the uh, science behind that, thinking behind those developing technologies that we'll go to, okay? So I have divided this, this, this complete lecture, this is three and a half hours. I have divided this into three parts with two breaks. I think that's okay. And then not it's not necessarily uh, equally, I have divided into one, one, one hour, uh, right? But it could be a little bit less or more because conceptually I have divided into three parts, right? The first part we will get into the uh, beginnings of the genome technologies and then we'll progress into the uh, genomics era, right? Okay. So uh, the first of all, the what is important to understand is why we need to uh, develop the genome technologies and that I told you just before that this is the fundamental process of the cell function, that is from, from the DNA to RNA to protein, and that to understand the cell function at the molecular level, we have to understand the relationship between the sequence of genes and, and, then, and then cell organ structure and function, right? That manifests into traits, right? All, all living organisms have traits. That is, to understand those traits, we have to understand the genes and their gene, gene, gene expressed um, in, in gene, that is the DNA and RNA, and then that's why we require uh, techniques to, uh, to understand the structure of DNA and RNA, okay? And then we have to develop me methods to use these mutations, the changes in this DNA and RNA to, uh, as a diagnostic tools. That's why we require the development of genome technologies. And then in the fundamental research, we have to understand, to understand the uh, properties of functions of the cells at the molecular level, we need to understand the structure functions of the DNA, RNA, and protein, right? And then, and to study the molecular basis of uh, cell development and differentiation, and also understand the evolution at the molecular level. So all these functions, in either in research or in the applied aspects, we need to, uh, to, to develop the technologies uh, which take us from DNA to RNA to protein to the function of the cell or organ, right? And also we have to develop the te techniques to uh, determine the genetic cause of the disorders, and also latest uh, nowadays is develop a new phase of medicine called the genomics medicine. For that, we need to understand the uh, genotype of the complete and the entire indivi individual in, in biology, the normal level uh, in conditions as well as in the distant condi conditions, right? So these are the different reasons you all know that's what we, we need to, to develop the uh, genome technologies. But that's how it's all started because before the gen genome technologies were developed, if you go back a couple of uh, centuries or century and a half back, so down the ages, we all knew that there are some traits in the family which go down from generation to generation, right? But nobody knew how, how they go down. Is there any pattern or is there any law or is there any rule to do that? And it was the first uh, Mendel, he developed, he, uh, he investigated this distribution of these traits and he showed that in this uh, first generation when then you have a dominant and recessive uh, traits, if in the F2 generation, they get distributed in, in threes to one ratio. And then if you get uh, traits which are neither dominant or recessive, they get distributed as one is to two is to one, right? And then if you have two traits here on the color and then the length of the tail, then they get distributed at one is to two. Where did I write? Now nine is to three is to three is to one, right? This is exactly, we can predict the different generations, how these traits get distributed. So in a sense, this is, was the beginning of geno, uh, geno genetics as well as it was the beginning of the genome technologies, right? This is one of the earliest technologies where we can accurately predict, if you could uh, uh, prepare the pedigree of the generations, you can accurately predict the distribution of the trait or disease, 
trait is, in the normal trait is a trait, and if the trait is not normal, it's abnormal, it is disease, we call it as a dis distribution of the disease, right? So this is the classical, I think that I call it as the first uh, tech, uh, genome technology development, also it's a start of, uh, that started with the beginning of the laws of genetics. And then, coming back, fast forwarding, and then in this uh, last 25, 30 years, genome technology has developed tremendously. And then there are classical, there are three types of genome technologies. One is a genetic tool, the second is a cytogenetic tool, and then third is a biochemical tool. You all must be knowing on this, l a, a genetic tool involves the linkage analysis, positional cloning, and cDNA selection, etc. Because this is the linkage analysis and positional cloning is a classical, we use the Mendelian laws to create the pedigree and then see the distribution of the disease and uh, identify the individual. And based on that, we go for the positional cloning or the cDNA selection techniques to uh, uh, position, to I identify the gene on the chromosome or on the locus. And it used to take years to identify one disease gene. For example, CTCF gene was discovered. It was like around $250 million was spent on that. And it took uh, more than a decade to identify that gene. So it was a slow but very definitive process. And then we have a cytogenetic tools uh, that involves karyotyping and fluorescence, even uh, fish techni uh, techniques. And then we have the biochemical tools. Example is the subtractor hybridization, differential display, and then the sage. So all of you have heard about these, these techniques? Yes? In general, how many of you, have, of you, all of you have heard all these techniques or know about these? I just want to know the background, right? Yeah, quite a few, but again, it looks like a half hour. So I'll just give an introduction uh, to all this, how, how these techniques work, because the uh, link advantage of this uh, linkage analysis of the genetic tools, classical genetic tools, is that this uh, gene associated with the disease can be identified in spite of not knowing its biological function. You don't know what this gene is doing. We have the cystic fibrosis muscles are weak, but we don't know the function of this, how the disease, the physiology of the disease, we don't know, but still you can identify the gene associated with this disease. It's a classical one, it takes a long time, it's more expensive, but it is a, it's a classical way of identifying the genes associated with these diseases. And then you come with the cytogenetic tools. And the cytogenetics means just to understand, you know, use the microscope, look under microscope. This also can be a powerful uh, technique because you just take the chromosomes in a, in a situation and then look these chromosomes under the microscope. So this is the typical microscopic picture of these chromosomes. And if you look into this, this is a chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. This is a normal chromosome. This is the normal chromosome 22. This is the normal chromosome 9. But in the abnormal situation in a CML chronic myeloid leukemia case, you see uh, extra chromosome material here fused. That comes from the chromosome 22. It is broken here. It comes here, gets fused here. And that gives rise to chronic uh, myeloid leukemia. You can just see under microscope. And this is how it has been depicted in this cartoon. Okay? The chromosome, one part of the chromosome breaks and gets fused to the another part of the chromosome. And that typically happens in mostly in the cancer types. That you can see this, uh, take the cells and in, in the metaphase, uh, 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 metaphase of the cell division and then look under a microscope and then diagnose. We also have a fish in, uh, fluorescence. Uh, usually in the fish technique, you take the DNA and then take the probe uh, and then um, label this probe with the immunofluorescence and then hybridize this with the, with the uh, DNA on the chromosome and then look under a microscope and you can see the fusion of this uh, chromosome 22 and chromosome 9 here, uh, and then that's how you uh, detect the fusion of those uh, different, different parts of the chromosomes in a given uh, uh, condition of the cell. So they're all very uh, powerful, uh, good techniques which were developed. And then if you want to go for the molecular biological tools for expression studies, particularly mostly they are used in research, okay? They involve the subtractive hybridization. You must have heard it was very popular in uh, 80s and 90s. And differential display was developed in 1990s. It was also very po very powerful technique. And then we have the sage. Out of these two, I'll explain you briefly about these two techniques. Okay. So subtractive hybridization is a very simple concept, right? Anybody have heard? Used? I don't think anybody has used this technique, but you might have heard, right? The subtractive hybridization. What 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 you can do is you can take a test uh, cell, or sometimes you can take a jerked cell or the T cell, the activated T cell. There are two different conditions. And then you can take the mRNA from these two, control and test, and then mix them in equal amount. Okay? And then convert, okay, convert that one into cDNA, and then can take into one mRNA, mix them into equal amounts. Okay? 
the MR and cDNA which have the which can match the sequence, they hybridize to each other, right? And then the mRNAs which are produced extra, which is uh, uh, which, which are uh, pro expressed in either control or test, which are not uh, ex differentially expressed between these two uh, situations, they don't get hybridized. They remain at a single standard. Okay, you can isolate that using the hydroxyapatite column, and then you can clone this and then sequence this. This was a very powerful technique which was used in the 80s and 90s, right, to understand the cell type specific gene expression. And then we have a differential display. This was developed in 1990s, early 1990s. This also, again, you have to have two cell types. One is a normal cell type, one is a uh, activated, like T cell activated uh, or uh, no resting T cell. Uh, here I'm giving a simple example. Then you take the RNA from both the cell types convert that into cDNA, and then put a synthetic adapter here. Why I'm telling this is the concepts which were developed earlier, same concepts were continued uh, in the latest technology, including the next generation sequencing. That's why I'm bringing these techniques uh, to explain to you that how the concept developed from the beginning to the current what we are today. So this is very important here. So in this subfactor hybridization, the idea was to convert that into cDNA, but while converting that, you have to have an oligo DT here primed, N1 and N2, and then add one heel. There's a synthetic uh, adapter as a heel. And then convert that into cDNA. We have the heel here. We have the double stranded cDNA. And then cut it with a four base cutter. The four base cutter, that is a restriction enzyme, that cuts it around 200 to 250 base pairs. When you do that, you get these different fragments. And there is one fragment at the three prime end, which is with the heel. We call it adapter nowadays. And then this heel is of the Y-shaped adapter, okay? You stick that Y-shaped adapter here, and then when you cut it with the restriction enzyme or sau 3 a or you know, different four-base adapters, HAPA2 or uh, MSP1 or sau 3 a or there are different four-base cutters are there, you cut it with that and then uh, uh, ligate at the both the ends, okay? Now you have the Y-shaped adapters, which is associated with the oligo DT, and then you have another Y-shaped adapter, which is ligated to the the to the uh, sticky ends after cutting with the four base cutter. And then you can PCR this out and then display that on a gel, right? You have the resting T cell and activated T cell and you can see differentially expressed bands here. See this, this is expressed here differentially, it's not expressed here, this is expressed here, not expressed here. So radio label this, earlier people used to do uh, labeling with the P32 and then cut these bands out, clone them and then sequence them. That's how I identify the differentially expressed genes. This is a very powerful technique and very popular technique. But important is that here, this is one of the earliest techniques where a Y-shaped adapter at both the ends, a synthetic adapter was used in this technique. And then the same adapters are being used in various different techniques, including next generation sequencing that we'll understand. This is one of the earliest techniques where this concept was developed. Any questions so far? Right? So. So far, we learned about these three basic fundamental technologies which were developed, right? Uh, one was the genetic tools. Second was the cytogenetic tools. Third was the bio biochemical tools. In that biochemical tools, I told you that there was the introduction of the concept of putting two synthetic D a short fragment DNA strands and, and both the ends of the primer. That this technology was developed sometimes in 2000, 1991 to 1993. Now, at the same time, in 1970s, another tool called uh, uh, sequencing of the DNA and then amplification of the DNA was developed, right? So, and uh, both these technologies won Nobel Prize because the kind of impact they had on, you know, uh, advancement of the scientific research in general, right? So, apart from all these technologies, even simple sequencing of DNA can be a powerful technique. Right? It can be a very powerful technique. What it can do? When you sequence the DNA, you to understand the function of the uh, cell or, the, or the to understand the structure or the sequence of the genome. For example, you identify a, a gene which has a uh, mutation or which, has, which is defective in certain conditions. But to understand, to know where those mutations are, we need to understand the sequence of that gene. So that is why we have to know what we are, we, we, are, we are supposed to sequence 
and then how to sequence it, and then how to extract the information from the SIG data, and then how to practically use that SIG data. Right? If you understand this, if you apply this sequencing uh, uh, intelligently, we can develop this into a powerful tool. Okay? And that exactly was done, and then the idea initially, the idea was to sequence a gene or a part of a gene. That was that's how it, it started in its uh, late 70s and 80s. Or you sequence a transcript, that is like a sequencing of a cDNA, and then I or uh, sequence a DNA which has a modified basis, or sequence of a, an, a chromatin at particular locus, in a short, uh, either in the promoter or the body of the gene, right? And then the method of sequencing was Sanger sequencing, and this was a very big uh, technical advancement in in 80s, 80s and 90s. Okay, so once this was accomplished, this became a routine practice. Then the idea was, instead of, and this is the basic fundamental, I think that all of you know the Sanger sequence is a very fundamental thing. You have the normal uh, dideoxy NTP here, and then you remove this hydroxyl group here, you put a hydrogen group here, and then it inhibits the progression of the uh, polymerase uh, action, and then it attenuates the, uh, the progression of the uh, strand, uh, the, the polymerization of the strand. And then you get all these uh, three prime and uh, truncated at one basis, the dideoxy basis strands here. And then you use the uh, 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 acrylamide gel and then uh, separate these strands and read the sequence. Right? This is the, is the fundamental of the uh, Sanger sequencing. And then coming back you know, from the sequencing a gene or a transcript, now the idea is instead of sequencing a gene or a transcript or, or uh, small portions, can we, uh, is it possible to sequence the entire genome? See, the ideas keep, keep developing, right? So from the cytogenetic tools to the genetic tools to identifying the disease, following the traits, to we would like to know, can we sequence a gene so wherever there is a defect is? Yes, we can sequence it. The technologies were developed, right? That the Sanger developed that technique uh, to how to sequence a gene. And then using that technique, we started sequencing uh, one cDNA, one gene, part of a gene, uh, or uh, in a cDNA, or the entire intron exons together, or the promoter regions, enhancer regions. So take different small, small parts of the genes, or the genome, or the locus, and then sequence them, right? But now the idea again is, be uh, after the idea was, instead of sequencing a gene, can we sequence the entire genome? Uh, let us take example of a bacterium. Then a bacterial genome is a small genome, less than a one megabase. And then instead of sequencing a gene, which is around two, three KB, because it doesn't have introns, it's a simple example I'm giving, can we sequence the entire bacterial genome? Is it possible to do that, right? Similarly, instead of sequencing one transcript, one cDNA, can I sequence all the RNAs expressed in a particular cell? Right? That was the idea that was developed. Similarly, uh, can I sequence all the modification, all the methylation sites of the entire genome instead of understanding the methylation sites of a particular promoter or a particular gene? Can I do that in all the genes in the cell? Right? And then similarly, a modification of the DNA that is at a histone level. Because if I, if I want to understand the structure of the chromatin at particular gene or on the promoter or the regulatory regions, can I s understand the structure of the chromatin at entire genomic level? So what are the implications? We can, we'll, we'll know what are the implications of this thinking. If you could put this thinking into practice. First, this is the good idea. Instead of gene to genome, transcript to transcriptome, chromatin to chromatome, but this idea is great. Once we have that idea, we have to put that idea into practice. To do that, we have to develop technologies, right? That's the importance of technologies. And then once we get this information, how to use that information? That comes analysis, okay? So the available technique, before we go into, because we are in the medical school here, we are, we are all doing the human genome, so I just wanted to explain how it started. It all started with the grant. It didn't start with the sequencing of the bacteria or, or, the, or, or the yeast, it started with the grand idea of can we sequence the entire human genome from gene to genome, right? So just to understand the complexity, we are going back, our thinking, we are going back ourselves to 19, you know, eight, late 80s. Let us think that we are in 19, late 80s. At that time, we are thinking of sequencing a human genome instead of sequencing a gene, uh, to we are sequencing the entire human genome. How do we do that, right? So to, to just to understand the complexity, the mass of the entire one genome in a cell is around five to six picograms. And then its, its length is around two meters, so very long, and it's very thin, right? Handling of the genome is also important. And then 
it has a three, three billion bases in the haploid conditions and it is separated into 23 uh, pieces, that three billion uh, haploid uh, bases, base pairs, they are chopped into 23 parts and then each part uh, is seen during metaphase as a chromosome, right? So to do this, available technology was the uh, Sanger sequencing, right? So the Sanger sequencing is a one strand at a time but the problem was that there was only sequencing technology available. The problem was that it can sequence only one strand at a time, 700, 700 base pairs, HMST chain, chain termination, highly accurate, but very slow. It's very slow. You can sequence 700 base pairs at a time. Imagine you have three billion bases if you're sequencing a haploid genome. The how much time it takes to sequence three billion if you're taking 700 base pairs at a time, right? That's, that's very painful, but again, the ideas were developed again, what do we do? So we have to sequence, instead of se sequencing one strand at a time, we have to sequence several strands at a time. Parallelly, we have to sequence many, many strands at a time, right? 700, you know, in, in, in many different reactions. So that means that we have to automate the sequencing process. So that's how thinking goes up, right? And so sequencing a gene, if you're sequencing, you can do it in your test tube with your hands. But if you're sequencing a genome, if you look at the size of the genome, three billion bases, and you are sequencing only 700 bases at a time, you can do that in this lifetime, right? One at a time. So you have to develop some kind of an automation process. And you have to develop high throughput process. And then high throughput means then the 96 well plate format came up. People thought idea that you know, we can uh, take the DNA into 700 base pair DNAs into 96 well plates and then sequence simultaneously 96 well plates. So 96. 700 base pair strands you are sequencing, which comes to around 7 kb at a time, right? No, 70 kb at a time, right? So from 96, well, quickly, the technology was improved to 384 bases, okay? And that was a big throughput. It was a big deal to develop this, this 360, 384 well plate. And then is this sufficient? At that time, that was done. That was the, the top most uh, automation process at the time. And then this, this process was used to start a sequencing human genome. And then this is what it took. It took around 13 to 15 years to sequence one human reference human genome. And then uh, the cost was $2.7 billion. <coughs> okay? So that was, the, that was the take on this, uh, you know, this was the automation process. This was Sanger sequencing tool this much of time. Right? And then that was a big deal. We, we understood the human gene was code, uh, coded. Then what do we do with that now, right? We have a entire human genome in our disposal. We know the sequence of all those, all the genes, all the chromosomes. So what do we do? The ingenious technique and the thinking was developed. The idea at that time was, can we sequence another genome? Yes, we can sequence. We have to spend 13 more years. And then we have to spend $3 billion more. Right? So instead of doing that, the smartly, we can think that instead of sequence another human genome, can we use the existing knowledge of the human genome and develop some other technology to make use of that uh, whatever available information of one human genome? And that is how microarray technologies were developed. Right? So what we can do in the microarray technology, we can break that entire three billion basis of the long strand, or six billion basis, the copy of those into small, small portions, okay? Then other technology called the synthetic, the chemical synthesis of DNA was available. Those technologies were developed, okay? And then chemically synthesize each part of that entire human genome and then put them as a spot on a chip, okay? And then investigate the other genomes because if I have that reference genome spotted as an array, then I can use the other genomes the test, this is called as a control normal genome, and then you can use as a test genomes, and against that printed arrays, and investigate, study the other genomes. Very simple, right? We don't have to sequence another human genome. Very simple uh, idea, but we have to put that into practice. Yeah? Uh, quick question, biochemically, how do they detect hybridization? Is it very similar to cyber, cyber green type? Yeah, fluorescence, label the DNA, detect it. Uh, make it single-stranded. Double-strand particularly, double, uh, label the double-stranded DNA, heat and thaw, 
heat and then free, uh, uh, and then chill it, make it single stranded, and then hybridize it. I, I'll explain to you. Oh, okay. Yeah, microarrays, I'll explain. How that microarray works, simple thing, right? And then we'll, descri we'll discuss more in the uh, microarrays, and then another technique called Seq phenome was developed. This is a mass spectrometry based. If you have those short DNA fragments of the entire human genome, and, and then if you want to identify whether there is AT or GC type of a SNP, then there is a molecular weight is different. Is it GC, molecular weight, is th it has a typical molecular weight. If it is an AT, it has a typical molecular weight. So you can uh, identify the molecular weight of that, and then based on that, you can identify it is either it is an AT type of a SNP or GT type of a SNP. So Sikinom was developed. Another, uh, another thing is, uh, is uh, technique is a nano string. Uh, this is again quantitation technique, but we'll discuss uh, microarray here because it, was, it has been widely uh, used even today, it is under use. Okay. This was used again for the whole uh, genome analysis level because once you identify sequence, human sequence was available, the idea there was again, to uh, can I do the uh, genome-wide analysis uh, studies with without sequencing another human genome. That was an idea, right? Got it? That's the advent of the micro microarrays. So the microarrays can be of two types, right? Uh, one is uh, it could be a printed, arrays and then the, the bead arrays. The printed arrays is, you know, you synthesize the uh, uh, um, short oligonucleotide and then just uh, spot it, print it, print it on, the, on, the, on the slide, or you can have it on the bead, so two different types, right? And then earlier, when we did that, I myself, sometimes in the late 90s, I used to PCR and then make the uh, 700 base pair, not short fragment, 700 base pair fragments PCR from the locus, gene locus, Hox or a globin locus, and then put them as a print. Just spot them and on our chip. And that's how we used to study uh, different loci. Okay. I will explain you what we did with that. Okay? And then uh, photolithography technology was developed by Nimbolgen around 2019, 1999, 2000 sometimes. The photolithography was like you synthesize the DNA on the slide itself. And it sticks to the slide tightly, and then printing and then synthesizing DNA goes simultaneously together, and then it, it revolutionized the microarray. Okay, that photolithography technology. And then, then people started making it around 50 to 75 base pair uh, length uh, long uh, short fragments. And then computerization came that time. We can break the entire human genome into short fra fragments, automate that, and then start printing arrays. So the basic fundamental principle of microarray, what microarray does, right? Fundamental principle of microarray is you get these arrays. They're all bead arrays, maybe, suppose. For example, you have different wells here. Th to make it simple, I have printed it here. Then you take the un you know, untreated one type, type A DNA, type 2 DNA, right? And then label them with a fluorescence, either green or red, typical fluorescence, and then combine them and then hybridize them to this array because there is a DNA on this array, single standard DNA on this array. Both these are single standard and then both these compete to hybridize. Microarray is nothing but fundamentally hybridization of the DNA. Hybridization of the DNA from the test DNA to the uh, DNA on the array. That's it. Yeah. Oh, this is an example. Irradiated, for example, if you take uh, cells I'm giving you example as one normal cell irradiated cell because normal cell irradiated cell can, can create a mutations in the DNA, right? So if you'd like to understand the mutations, you can do that. Or if you irradiate the DNA, you can also change the uh, expression of the genes. It could be a normal T cell. It could be a activated T cell. It could be a stem cell. It could be differentiated stem cell, different places. It could be two s the cell at the two, two uh, physiological stages or developmental stages. It's just an example. So this is the basic fundamental thing. You know, you have the DNA on the microarray. You have the test DNA. Just hybridize it and try to understand. The, with this only simple concept, we can do many, many things with this. It's just one has to think what, uh, what we can do with just by this hybridization technique. OK? We'll go through that, what we can do. OK? So 
we can do many things, as that's why I told you, right? I'm uh, taking the example of the Illumina bead array here because this is the popular one nowadays, and this is what we use in the lab here in the genomics facility. But the concept is same for all types of tec technologies. So we can get in a high density bead based arrays. You know, we can have the a lot of uh, uh, the entire human genome or the parts of the human genome we can select all the promoters, all the coding genes, all the not whatever would like to select, we can select. We can also do the transcriptome profiling. We can uh, do the genome wide analysis. We can understand the methylation status of the DNA, right? That is the epigenetics, not at the gene, but at the entire uh, genome level. We can also, this is a fully customizable. We can ag again uh, do whatever you want to do. You can select certain genes, certain part of the genome or entire genome. And also we can do multiple samples, you know, to, uh, together simultaneously, right? We can make it as a high throughput. So, so how that simple thing, how that simple thing works, how the simple hybridization uh, of the DNA on the array, test DNA and DNA uh, array can provide so much of information, right? This is the typical array I'm showing. This is uh, this is the typical array. We have multiple um, uh, slots we have. Each one will have a hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of beads on this, and then each bead will have a DNA on this for hybridization, and then this is this hybridization of the fluorescence is detected on that machine. This is a scanner. Okay, then how does that this work? So we have one bead here, right? We have a small bead, and on that bead there is a synthetic DNA, like adapters we saw, right? And then this is the synthetic DNA we have. It's around a uh, small 29 base pairs, and then we have the uh, part of the human genome, which is around 50 base pairs. Imagine three billion genes. 3 billion bases, each base, you know, we have cut it into 50 base pairs now. We can have millions of such probes into that chip, in this small area of the chip. Okay? And then what we can do, then we can take the DNA, it could be a CRNA here, right? Suppose the expression profiling, if we are doing it, we take a CRNA. How do you do that CRNA? If you take the RNA, hybridizing that RNA becomes a problem because um, we need to have the copy. Instead of cDNA, you'd make a cRNA. And uh, generally, you take you know you you take the RNA, convert that into cDNA, and then put a T3 or T7 promoter on that, and do another transcription. So you get the cRNA. Right. So convert that into cRNA, and then label that cRNA with any fluorescence label you want. Psi psi three and psi five is a popular one, right? And then hybridize this. Wash. Wherever you see the fluorescence on any bead, then you know that that is the expression level. And then the amount of expression depends on the amount of fluorescence. You ad, uh, estimate the relative intensities of these, um, uh, on, on these particular beads, right? And that's how you determine which gene is expressed. In the entire transcriptome, n number of genes are expressed, n number of genes are repressed, or n number of genes are expressed like all together, new expression takes place because there is virtually no expression in one, one particular condition, then suddenly you see the expression there. So you can differentiate based on the fluorescent intensities, either you can s uh, detect the newly expressed genes or the genes which are already uh, expressing, they are overexpressing, or the genes which are already expressing, they are underexpressing. Right? Clear? It's highly dependent on the wash step. Yes. Because there's, because there's not like a there's not like a quintessence or DS uh, structure. Yes. So. We'll come to that. See, every technique has plus minus. So we will s we'll understand the benefits of this technique. The conceptually, I'm taking you. See, information you can get. Google it, go to NCBI, you get the information. You can collect the information later. But here in this class, I would like to uh, to give you the concepts, how the thinking process developed, and then to, to bring us what we are today, and then how we what we can do in future. Right? That's all the idea. Yeah. Uh, because it depends on this. For example, if this is the uh, human genome, we have the plus or minus strand here. And then based on that, if you have the RNA plus strand, and if you have this plus strand here, plus strand, plus strand, don't, they don't hybridize. That we need to have the complementary strand. So that is how to make that complementary strand. It is, again, convert back into the complement. There's no reverse transcription directly matches RNA. Yeah, exactly. Okay, 
So this is what we can do, simple expression studies. And now, how do you do genotype, genotyping, right? So this is an expression again. Okay, how do you do genotyping here again? Same thing. Instead of RNA, you take DNA, right? So small pieces of DNA. How do you do that? Particularly first initially, you take the genomic DNA again, bake it into small pieces, or that genomic DNA, you just amplify that because you take a small amount of DNA on a one or two micrograms or less than one microgram, it is too small amount of DNA, amplify that, bake it into small pieces, and hybridize that pieces here, right? Hybridize it here. And then this probe which we make on the ar array, this probe, it has that 50 base pairs. At the end, you have either G or T, right? That is a SNP. SNP will be either GC or AT, right? And then when you hybridize that, you hybridize this here, suppose there is a T here, right? Extra T here overhangs. And then you develop a technique wherein your polymerase adds only one base at a time. Single base extension, chemistry you develop. You can do that. Like, you know, Sanger has shown how to do that. Right? And then you can also you know, make variations and do that. Let us see that, you know, let's not get into that chemistry, but let's say that we have the polymer, we have the chemistry, which just only one single base extension. Right? So what we are doing is here is we are doing single base extension. So to while doing so, we add all these oligonucleotides here, which are chemically, uh, which, uh, which have fluorescence. Either green or red. There are only two types. GC is a SNP and then AT is a SNP. Label GC with one fluorescence, AT with another fluorescence, right? Suppose here is this the T overhang is here, and then A sits on this, and A has suppose a red color. And then you know that red color belongs to AT type of a SNP. And when you wash it out, and then when you look at the fluorescence, at that particular sequence, if you see red color, that is AT. If you see the green color here, that is GC type of a SNP. Simple, isn't it? Same hybridization again. What's happening here? RNA you are hybridizing, DNA you are hybridizing, but smartly you are trying to detect the amount of expression and also the type of SNPs. Right? So that's how the different types of, you know, now it is up to you. I mean, you can have part of the genome, few genes, or all promoters. There are core promoters, core genes you know, different types of the entire human genome or part of the genome, depending on, you know, you can customize, you can synthesize the arrays accordingly and then go for the GWAS studies. And that exactly was done with the, with the great results. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Pardon me? We can do that too. It depending on the you know the, the companies what they can we can do it that's a good idea yes yeah different one you can add yes it depending on the, the company guys if they say that we have developed this and then convert that to crna they might have done that you know sometimes rna dna hybridization is very stronger than the dna dna hybridization or rna rna or making that into five prime to three prime they have to go back and make the minus strand on that so depending on the convenience of the particular companies they make it you can do that Yes. Okay, this is clear. So, for the genotyping, we can do methylation. How do we do that? Methylation, right? So, we can create again the probes with CG, right? CPG islands, CPG uh, dinucleotides have the methylation sites. Let's see that the we are studying the methylation at the at the C, at the CGs. Now we can have the methylated locus here, we have CG, methylated B type. And then when you extend it, one base here, you cannot extend here A because it's a GC. Okay, it says it's a methylated site. The unmethylated site uh, uh, has the CA here. And then if it is CA, it, you can add it here, but it is a CG, you can't add it here, right? the C gets converted into T. Same thing you can do instead of extension, you can have a CG as an extension. The end, end of the uh, oligonucleotide uh, could be CG. 
the CG could be methylated type of a CG, CG could be unmethylated type of the CG, which in unmethylated type, it gets converted into, C gets converted into T. <coughs> you can investigate the methylations also. Cool, isn't it? Only one human genome was sequenced, and that information on that one human genome was smartly used by developing the technologies, right? Called microarray technologies, right? So, and then what else we can do? We can also look for the copy number variations, right? You must have heard array CGS. Anybody? How many of you heard array CGS? Right? Okay, few people. Okay, interesting. See, it's called as a comparative hybridization. How we do that? It's simple. It is equivalent to the expression studies. In the expression studies, what do you do? You take the RNA from two different types, cell types of the same cell type, cell type in the different conditions, mix them, and then hybridize, and then look for the you know, relative expression, right? Same thing you do at the genome level. If you want to understand the duplications in the genomes, and then instead of RNA, you take the pieces of DNA and then mix them together, right? That's exactly is here. You have the patient test sample here. You have the reference sample here. You label it with the green and then red here and then mix them into equal amounts. When you hybridize here, see if both are in the equal amounts, both hybridize equally. You get the yellow, green and, uh, you know, red and green, uh, uh, green mix. You get the yellow color on that. That is the ratio is one, so there is no changes. Okay, there is no duplication or there is a loss of uh, uh, locus there or the gene there, there's no deletion there. But if it, uh, if it is more than one ratio, it is duplication. If they're less than one, there is a deletion. So you can also study the copy number variations on the genome. So this is what it is. I explained here in, the, in a given situation type, the clinical uh, type here. You have the patient DNA or control DNA. You label them, put them on the microarray here. And then equal hybridization is normal condi condition here between the two. And then uh, if you get one particular type is more green fluorescence, red fluorescence is more, you get the dosage loss. If the green fluorescence is more, it is a dosage gain. And that's how you analyze these spots on the computer, and then you can show that there is a deletion in this region. The concept what I'm telling you here is that just one human genome was sequenced, that $2.7 billion which was used, and then 13 years of hard work did not go waste. That information was smartly utilized for all purposes, for in research as well as in diagnostics, developing a new technology called microarray. And then we made the effective use of that information. Right? Any questions? Appreciate this? Right? Improvement? And then what else we can do with the microarray? Right? We did expression analysis, we did methylation, we did copy number variations. What else we can do? Popular one. Can we study the genome-wide analysis of the, uh, we did also methylation studies, we did genome-wide methylation studies. Can we also study the genome-wide analysis of the modification of the histones. This is what we thought of doing this. It was not available. We thought of doing this. How do we do this? So we thought that, for example, in a typical chip, how many of you have done chip chromatin immunoprecipitation? OK. Maybe many people want to need to know, right? So in a chip, what you do is you take the entire human chromatin. The chromatin is the DNA and then histones together, right? And then, uh, smartly, if you would isolate that chromatin by phenol chloroform extraction or general extraction, you break that association between protein and DNA, right? So to keep the association together, you have to chemically stick them together. There should be a glue. That chemical glue is formaldehyde. If you add formaldehyde to the cells or the nuclei, that formaldehyde covalently attaches the histone, that is the protein and DNA together. Here the protein DNA is histone and DNA and the transcription factors and the DNA. Okay? And the histones are modified uh, depending on the um, structure of the chromatin as well as the depending on the state of the um, gene expression. The gene is not expressing or expressing in those situations, there are different types of histone modifications are present. 
Okay. Now you want to understand what are those modifications, or you want to understand the uh, the uh, binding of the transcription factor at the entire uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the genome level. How do you do that using microarrays? Right. So that's what we we started working on this, and then what you do is initially to take the chromatin, um, add the formaldehyde to this, make it you know, covalently uh, bound, and then break it, sonicate this, break it into small pieces of the DNA protein adduct. Okay. The beauty of this formaldehyde treatment is, at 37 degrees or at the room temperature, 25 to 37 degrees, it is you get a stable adduct. If you raise the temperature to 30, 65 degrees and keep it for several hours, usually you keep it overnight, and then this interaction yeah, gets reversed. Okay, so first you interact it, break it down, use antibodies against that particular region. Either it's a modified histone. Here we have used this for the transcription factor. Then pull down this immunoprecipitate these DNAs which have harbor this, and when you do that, and then you just take it to the higher temperature then you can uh, reverse this uh, interaction between the protein and DNA, and then uh, extract the DNA using the phenyl or chloroform, or just digest that protein with the protein SK, and then extract the DNA to get the better uh, DNA uh, yield. Right? Once you do that, what do you do? You hybridize that to the microarray again. Right? How do you do that microarray? That time, the ENCODE program started. You know ENCODE programs? Anybody has heard? Yeah. And there, the ENCODE program was a part of the genome was being studied. There, the arrays, uh, something called it the tiling arrays were since made. Tiling arrays means earlier there used to be a arrays were made different parts of the uh, uh, genome or the chromosome, right? There used to be gaps. Now uh, you make arrays one after the other. You know, one to 50, 50 to 100, 101 to 151, like continuous, uh, representing continuous strand of the DNA or the chromosome or the locus of the region. When you do that, your resolution increases. Suppose if it hybridizes exactly at a particular region, you know that you know, there is a, this, uh, 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 the, the transcription factor binds at that particular uh, site, which is 50 base pairs. Right? Simple. That's what we did. And for that, I was telling you, this is what we published in 2002, this technique. And then we did not do 50 base pairs at that time. Tiling arrays were used later, but we made the tiling arrays ourselves. We selected this globin locus because it contains multiple genes. It is developmentally regulated, and it has an uh, enhancer 50 kb away from that beta globin gene. And then we selected GATA1 site. Why? GATA1 is an erythroid specific transcription factor. It binds to all erythroid uh, specific genes, including the beta globin gene. And if you look into this beta globin gene, all these transcription factors, uh, GATA binding sites, it has around 150 GATA binding sites. How many genes you can probe? You can, any, anything, any amount, depending on the array type. Yeah, yeah, you can design your own array. You can have a complete entire human genome array, different parts, right? Or design your own array. That's the beauty. That's what we designed our own array here. First time when we did this, yes. Yes, you can have overlapping tiles because the tiles which were developed for the for by Nimblegen for the ENCODE, it was a 50 base pair. Uh, probe which with around uh, seven or ten uh, base pairs or overlapping uh, sites, I think, yeah, or ten base pairs, I don't remember now. Yes, they are overlapping. So we, for this, because 150 GATA sites are there on this, 75 KB region, and if you take each GATA site, synthetically make oligonucleotide, and you do the gel uh, mobility shift assay. Have you heard about this, gel mobility shift assay? Yes, yeah. So what you do is you take the DNA, double-stranded DNA, uh, label it with P32, add the GATA there, it binds. When you run a gel, the unbound gel runs faster, GATA bound gels uh, run slower, so that's how you detect that GATA is binding there. And if you transfer it to the nitrocellulose membrane and then do the Western, then you can detect the presence of GATA there, right? That's what you do, gel shift assays. <laughs> when you do gel shift assays, you can show that in vitro it can bind to all these sites. Is it real? Is it so? In vivo, is it binding to all these sites? And then what we did the first time, we took 700 base pair fragments. I did PCR myself. And then we took 75 uh, those uh, PCR products. I just spotted them on an array. That was the 75 spots array. Okay? And then we took Sci3, Sci5, and then we hybridized this. And then we detected the, these two regions. 
There's a lot of noise here. It has a lot of repetitive regions were there. It looks very simple, crude experiment, but that time it was uh, a good achievement to show that yes, indeed, we can do genome-wide chromatin um, modification or the, the in vivo transcription binding studies using the microarrays. And that's after <coughs> that, chip chip technology became very popular. You might have heard about this chip chip or chip on chip technology, right? So these are the fascinating use of the first human genome that was sequenced, right, uh, from beginning from 1990 to 2003. Okay, while this was going on, while this was going on, there was also idea thinking was going on. How do we sequence another human genome? Right, the idea was going on. Right, we are not, not happy with, we are happy with what we could achieve using the microarray technologies and make use of the information of the first human genome, but can we sequence another human genome? Right? How do we do that? Okay? So before we discuss that, let's have 10 minutes break. Is it okay? So where we were, we, were, we, were, we just discussed about the microarrays and then they said that by the, this microarray technologies were being applied in research and diagnostics or you know, in applied uh, areas at the same time, there was a thinking to see if we could sequence another human genome, right? So, but question now is, why, why we need to sequence another human genome, right? Idea is good, we have to sequence another human genome, but why, right? Microarray technology is doing good, right? Do you agree that it is doing good? Do you all agree? I convinced you, right? Microarray is great technology. It is answering all the questions. It can do methylation, gene expression. It can also do the, uh, identify the histone modifications, DNA modifications, methylation. It can do everything, whatever we are asking for. Pardon me? As long as you know where you are. Yes, but you know, it is answering the questions, right? But again. Not if you don't know they exist. Right. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is that although it is doing great, but again, every great technology has its own plus and minus some deficiencies too, right? So let us see what we know the greatness about the microarrays, right? More or less you are convinced that you know you got, you felt very good, happy, I could see that glow on your faces that how, how we could utilize that one hu human genome. But again, let us see what are the concerns of the microarray technique. The microarray design requires a prior knowledge of the genome or genomic features, right? If you don't have prior knowledge, we cannot develop microarrays. We need to sequence. Suppose you want to have microarrays of the mouse genome. We can't. You have to sequence the mouse genome, right? Similarly, microarray of the monkey or the plant, we can't. We have to first sequence that. Then you can use that as a reference to develop microarray technology. Right? That means that we have to sequence if you want to do anything other than investigating the human genome or different human genomes. There are different human genome is not static, it's not the same genome you know, for every, every individual on the earth of seven billion human genomes. Or if you want to understand the variety in the human genome, we have to sequence, right? Microarray doesn't help. Next, a major obstacle is that the cross hybridization between similar sequences. It's a hybridization technology, right? And then the se sequences are similar, then there could be a cross hybridization. That is a very severe limitation with microarray. So washing conditions are very important. And it all depends on that, uh, the person, graduate student or postdoc or a technician who is washing these arrays. So technician to technician, it will vary. So high signal to noise, uh, noise ratio, because how much probe you add, right? Bound on bound probe, too much if you add, then becomes a problem. Right? It all depends on the, the, the pipetting, how good the person uh, does pipetting, how patiently would one, one does. And then micrograms of DNAs are needed. You need to have the micrograms of DNA. It looks less, but again, if you would like to use small amounts of DNA depending on the conditions, if you want to use few cells uh, from brain biopsy or any biopsy, few number of cells, needle biopsies you do. So, or nowadays you are going for single cells, if you are doing differentiations, single cells, 
you can't use microarrays for that. It is too little amount. Okay. There are there are limitations, and then uh, there is a concern again that because it's a hybridization based, fluorescence intensities differ from experiment to experiment, site to site. So reproducibility, exact reproducibility, becomes a problem. Right? Conceptually, we'll get there is an expression of this RNA, but how much? To lab to lab, there are different variations. So, the statistically, if you put that standard deviation, is very very big. Okay. So, so these are all limitations. We did a great job with all these limitations, but again, we have to move forward. We have to move forward, and then the only way we can move forward in this area is start sequencing another human genome or another species or many, many more species, right? Agreed? So how do we do that? So I, what I'm saying first generation sequencing, why I'm saying for second generation sequencing, right? So this is a first generation sequencing, Sanger sequencing, because first time he showed that, how to sequence the DNA. That was a great concept. And then this is the we went through this slide. I'm reproducing this slide here again because to just to emphasize the greatness of the Sanger sequencing. You can sequence one at a time and then 700 base pairs. Sequencing is by chain termination, right? Remember this chain termination. Advantage is highly accurate. It's a go gold standard, OK? It's a gold standard. And then we use this technology to sequence the first human genome, right? And then can we seek use this technology for the second human genome? I said, yes, but again, you have to spend this much amount of time, this much amount of money. So what is important here, right? We have to, that happens with everything, time and money. These two aspects are very important, right, everywhere. So we have to take care of these two. Less time, less money. Yes? Okay, how do you know that? Highly accurate. If you do it many, many more times, depending on the experience, many times you would do that, and you get the reproducibility is very high. Not necessarily too fast, but too accurate. Yeah. If you sequence one second times, there is no errors there. There are no errors. Accurate accuracy in the sense there are very uh, less error rate is very, very low. Okay. So. What is the first, if now if you want to reduce both time and money, so what is essential here again? What, what they did to reduce the time and money from one tube, doing reaction in one tube, they took it to 96 well plate, they took it to 384 well plate. That means what? Throughput. We had to do the parallel sequencing of many DNA strands. Break it into small pieces, do the parallel sequence of all these strands. 384 well, can we increase? This is the first idea, can we increase? How much, million? Can you do million, million well plates? Right? 384, why 384, why double 384? Like, can we do million? Right? Literally, million. Million means what? Again, right? Like this, small nano wells. Right? Do this sequencing reaction in small billion plates. Right? So, if you want to do in a million place Sanger sequencing, we can do it. Why not? Right? You can do a nano, you know, well plate, reduce the re reaction volume. M money you'll also re you are reducing because you are using less reagents. Million DNA strands you are sequencing. 700 base pair multiplied by a million is how much? 0.7 billion. 700 multiplied by 10 raised to 6. Right, 0.1 billion. Very close. You have the three arrays like this: million plate uh, base, uh, million well arrays. You can sequence one human genome. Great. Did I convince you <laughs> that if you make a million well array, you can sequence a human genome at the cheaper price, faster? Right? Yes. Concept is good, great. But how to do it? See, idea is great. First, get the idea. Get a big idea. Like, you know, don't deter, don't, you know, get scared of having a big idea, get a big idea, and then again, start executing it. How do we do that? Right? And now, million well, great. Then now we have available technology, Sanger. Let's go back to poor old Sanger. 
And then when we do that, what's the problem with the Sanger? Is it a problem or not? Can we do that with Sanger sequencing? If you do the Sanger sequence a million well, even if you go for the Sanger sequence, what are available here, 37, 30, those machines from the ABI, they are 384 well-played format machines, 96 well-played format machines. Every time, if you understand the basics of the Sanger sequencing, it will be important now, because you all know dideoxy termination, you all know blah, blah, it takes. But if you exactly understand the concept of the uh, Sanger sequencing, you will know what is the deficiency of the, in the Sanger sequencing. If you try to increase the throughput, what is the limitation there? The basic fundamental feature of the Sanger sequencing is you are terminating the chain elongation, right? And then, to understand where it got terminated, that's how you sequence by detecting where it got terminated, which base termi added was added, which terminated the sequence. And then look for that base, and that's how you build a sequence. Right? To do that, what you, what you need to do? You need to separate those steps. You need electrophoresis. And when you do this electrophoresis, 384, you have the capillary electrophoresis there. The capillary electrophoresis was developed. Earlier, that used to be gel pour acrylamide in that big gel and then do that. But later, when the automation came, capillary electrophoresis was developed. That was great technology development, automation. But now, from 384 wells, can we have million capillary well electrophoresis? That is difficult, right? That is tough. Million electrophoresis at a time, that will add to the cost, right? Can we do that? That is a problem with the technology development, right? That means now, if you want to do this now, cheaper and faster, million well plate, we need to think different technology. We have to leave Sanger behind. That's why we said it is a first generation technology. It now the term becomes very, you know, you can understand the term, why it is a first generation technology. It served its, its purpose. We have to move on to the next generation. Right? Agreed? You're convinced? Right? So now what do we do? <laughs> next generation is what? What do we do? Sanger gave us an idea how to develop a better idea than Sanger had. <laughs> right? We can do. If Sanger can do, we can do because he gave us the inspiration to do something better. Right? So to do that again, what Sanger did, he went by the, looked into the basic biochemistry of the nucleic acids and tried to, you know, make changes in that biochemistry and then try to develop that into a technology, right? Now, can we go back again to the, to, the, to the nature, to the cell, and see what cell does, right? And then try to learn from that cell, right? This is what cell does, replication, right? Cell has this RNA, DNA hybrids here, the Kawakazaki fragments. And then it adds bases while DNA replication happens. Right? Can we make of this use, make use of this cellular process? Instead of terminating, uh, instead of detecting the base after termination, can we detect the base after addition? Opposite way of thinking. Instead of sequencing by termination, can we develop a sequencing by synthesis? If you add, keeps adding base, then you can detect that addition of the each base, right? When you do that, why we are doing this? If you do that, you don't have to separate. There is no electrophoresis. A major hurdle is gone, right? Clear, right? So how do we do that? Before we do that, we have to see at a molecular level what happens here. This is the template strand. These are the nucleotides. And then this is the phosphate here. And then it, that goes from 5 prime to 3 prime. You add the base here, right? When you add that base, what exactly happens? So you understand everything clearly, exactly what is happening to develop that into, to use that into some kind of a technology development, right? So this is the molecular level. And then when we look very closely into this addition of one base, this is the substrate and this is the product. Simple, right? Substrate and product. Substrate is, there are two species. One is the DNTP and this is the uh, DNA template strand and this is the catalysis, catalyzed by the DNA polymerase, right? When you look into the product, there are three products. 
right? One is the base which is added, one phosphate molecule, pyrophosphate, and one is the hydrogen ion is released in the medium. Okay? So when we are detecting, trying to detect the addition of the base here, we can detect any of these three species. Right? Either you can detect the release of pyrophosphate and say that that base is added and then keep on detecting pyrophosphates, keep on adding every time, and then we can you know, build the sequence. Or you can detect the release of the hydrogen ion, or you can detect the addition of the base itself. Cool, right? Simple, right? So how do you do that? The first technology that was developed in Brantford, Connecticut, very close to us, they thought, decided to detect the release of pyrophosphate. Okay, how did they do that? You have to go back to nature and try to understand the different cellular functions in, in nature and then to put them together to develop a technology. That is the, you know, how, how well you do that. So basically what it was done, that you, know, you take a bead again, in that bead you have the synthetic oligonucleotides. You have to go back to that concept which I told you that 19, 90s, 91, 92, when the differential display was developed, they developed the concept of adding the synthetic adapters, right, to the DNA. Same concept was re uh, repeated here. They added the, broke the DNA into small pieces, added the synthetic adapters. And then the complementary of those adapters were of that particular small bead, okay? And when you put that adapter to the DNA, you can stick it to the bead, right? When you stick it to the bead now, you can add a primer here. When you add a primer here, the polymer is here, primer here now. Now the idea now is if you add all DNTPs, within a second everything you know gets double stranded. There is no time to detect which one went first, which went later. Right? That means you have to develop again a concept like microarray one base at a time not more than one base. That means what? How can we do that? So we can, instead of adding all the four DNTPs, add only one, <laughs> right? If it is T here, A gets added. If you add C, nothing comes here, n right? If we add T, if it is T here, add A, now A sits here, it doesn't prolong because there is no other base available. Easy, cool, simple idea, right? All the brilliant ideas, they start with simple thinking. Okay, add that. Okay, you added A, then what? How do you detect that addition? Because it's a molecule, you don't see anything with naked eye. Okay, after you're adding the A, it releases the pyrophosphate. How do you detect that pyrophosphate? The basic idea was, you take here in that solution, you add this amino phosphosulfate, it's a compound. Hmm? Convert that pyrophosphate into something which you can detect. Pyrophosphate you can't detect. How do you detect pyrophosphate? Do something to that pyrophosphate with which you can detect it. It's released in the medium. It was present on the DATP. From that DATP, that PPI was cleared off and it was released. Now you have to detect that. How do you detect that? That's the question. You can keep thinking different methods, but I'll explain to you what method was people thought and then how they employed that method. That gives you the concept, the idea, the fun behind that, the intelligence behind that. There is a compound called, they use this compound called amino pyro or phosphosulfate, adenine py phosphosulfate, sorry, adenine phosphosulfate. Instead of ADP, they use APS. Instead of another phosphate, they added sulfur. Why they added sulfur? because there is an enzyme called sulfurylase. It's an enzyme present in bacteria to humans everywhere. It is present in the sulfate metabolism, <coughs> okay? That sulfurylase can take this APS and PPI, convert that into ATP. Okay, how they thought that? That is intelligence. That sulfurylase enzyme was present somewhere in the literature. They found that. They got them together. That is intelligence. You have to study, understand meditate on that, I want to develop this, okay? That's why they did PPI, 
got ATP. Okay, first pyrophosphate became ATP. Now what? How do you detect that ATP? Right? They thought again. Now add another uh, luciferin in this. The same reaction. And add a luciferase. Then this luciferase puts that ATP on the luciferin and then emits a photon. Cool, isn't it? So when you do this reaction, add APS, sulfuralase, luciferin, and then luciferase together in that solution, in that one small micro well plate, or one of all those million wells, each well of the, those million well plate. And then wherever you get one photon, A was added there. Out of the million wells, 100,000 wells, they emit photon when the A was added, ATP was added. Those 100,000 wells, that sequence has A. Wash everything, remove the whole thing now. Now add GTP, DGTP, keep on adding and keep on extending this. Isn't it cool? And that's exactly how the first next generation sequencing technology came into being in around 2005. This is popularly was known as a 454 technology. You must have heard 454, right? Wherein they use the sequencing by synthesis method using this different chemistry and then they said that we can detect light. Use the camera to detect the light there. Almost million wells they used it. And that's how suddenly from billions the human genome sequencing came to millions. So do they, do they wash on one of, one of the substrates remove it, wash on another substrate. Keep it. adding one by one, yes. So they have to do four cycles per basically? No, ATGC, you can add A, T, G, C, A, T, G, C every time. Right, so you have to do four cycles per base pair position. No, one cycle per base pair. Four type of, uh, nu I mean, four type of nucleotide. Nucleotide, you go, go cycles, you know, A, T, G, C, A, T, G, C, or G, A, T, C, or C, G, A, T, whatever. See, one cycle, see, add, you are adding only A to detect only addition of A, exactly. What if the A is not there, then, then, then this, this well, there won't be any photon on this well. Right. Out of a million wells, some will have A, some will not have A or T there. Out of a million wells, right, some will have T, some will have A, a here. Some will have C here, some will have G here. There are some wells which will take the cycle. Exactly, not all wells will illuminate with addition of one D A uh, NTP. What happens if you have two? Uh, two, yes. Two, two T's. Two, or repeat, yeah. Repeat. If you have two T's, right. you get two photons. So you just are able to measure by the by you're able to scale by In the intensity. Yes, number of photons. Intensity of photons. Intensity, yeah. One photon, two photon your intensity, right? But you can say one, it will double, it will triple, it will quadruple. But what if there are stretches of uh, fifteen T's? Ah, I can't tell after after five six T's I can't detect accurately. That is the limitation of this. Homopolymers. If you have stretches of A T G C's, uh, that becomes a problem. After six seven eight, they are developing more technology, more algorithms. Now your computers come into being, cameras come into being, detect much accurately in these uh, stretches. But if there are no stretches are there, because accurately you can do that. So that is a limitation of this technology. Okay. So that's not even when you are thinking it, you can you can understand the technology limitation. So homopolymer you know, stretches of ATGCs, you can do it under five, six, seven. Earlier it was like a four, they said after that five, you can do six, seven. They went up to a certain amount after that, it is tough to do that. But the, and the big amount of genome is there, which functional genome, which doesn't have all these stretches, we can use that for the sequencing. Okay, cool, clear? So what else we can do? This is how is the well paid format. We have these beads. So again, if you are using only one here, the fun part is only one here, you can get one photon. One photon is too weak to detect accurately again, right? So what do you do? So you have these oligos here. You just amplify this on this bead, you know? Took it in the mycelial, you know? Uh, and then amplify on this bead and you get multiple strand on this bead and put these beads into these wells. And then create a well size in such a way that you get only one bead in per well. If you put two beads in a well, it becomes a problem. So that is how out of million well plates, if you do, you increase your efficiency to put as many single beads in as many wells as possible out of those 100 million, 
initially if you put that one, be one bead at a time in one well, you get only 500,000 beads. If you get increased more, so efficiency or increased titration between the one stand should go and, and sit with only one bead. There should not be two different stands if they are on the one bead, it becomes a problem. Right? You reject that. You don't sequence that. That's how titration, basic high school mathematics, picomolar concentration, you get so many amount of strands of DNA, so many strands of so many number of beads, you, you then stick them together. That's how you have to develop those, uh, you know, revive your high school uh, mathematics and skills to do this. Okay? Clear? So next, if you go next to this, this is the 454. First NGS sequencer came into market. Quickly again, what is the next product? We use the release of uh, phosphate, that the first technology came in. And quickly the same guys, they said that instead of pyrophosphate, we will de detect the release of hydrogen. Same technology, everything same here. They use the pyrophosphate release of hydrogen instead of here, this is the actual chip. These are the nano wells here. So instead of when hydrogen is released, they detected the ion uh, sensitive layer they had and then they had an ion sensor here. That ion sensor uh, detects the release of hydrogen ion. Same thing instead of phosphorus, that APS, pyrophosphate, no camera here. It becomes much cheaper. No camera here. Just detect by voltage, uh, uh, by detecting the, the, the release of hydrogen by, by de developing the uh, ion sensor here. That's why it was called as an ion torrent. Still it is being used, this machine. Uh, no. This is an actual release of a proton. This is not hydrogen bonding. This is the actual release of hydrogen. It's a release of proton in the in the solution. If I go back to explain to you, this is not the hydrogen bonding. Yeah, this is not the hydrogen bonding between these. Okay, Hi not hydrogen bonding between between these, but it is the release of this hydrogen. Hydrogen bonding is between these. Okay. This is the hydrogen, yeah. This is the hydrogen ion is released in the medium during this reaction. You are detecting that release. 454 technique, which I explained to you, it detected the release of pyrophosphate using that APS, sulfuryllase, and then luciferase, right? And then they developed the, uh, the in that same well, they, they, they developed their own uh, the, 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 the compound or chemical or whatever you call it, electrochemical, which detects the release of that hydrogen ion that charge, positive charge. And then that records that addition of that particular base. So here what is important here is that here there is no need of any cameras, okay? So it becomes uh, cheaper and then it becomes faster, right? That's how it is, this, this is how you get signals, right? So this was cool. So that's why it's developed and then, you know, from billions it came to millions and it, it took, you know, a month in a month or two you can sequence the entire human genome. But again, even though if you say mi million wells, if you, if you want to go down below that, you want to go down below that, what do you do? 10 million now? Right? 10 million? But it becomes now, because the nanotechnology is the problem. 10 million wells doing the reaction in those small wells, it's a pain. Again, it's a difficult thing to do. Right? It was tough. So the creation of the wells should not become a limitation now to increase more and more throughput. Because imagine millions, spending a couple of million dollars for another human genome is cheaper than the $3 billion, but it is still not practically usable. Okay, what was the second human genome which was sequenced? Anybody knows? Whose sequence genome was, was, there, was it? Watson, yeah, Watson's genome was sequenced using the 454 machine. Okay, they showed that, you know, we can use this next generation sequencing technique to sequence another human being, a uh, human genome. Yes? Um, so maybe I'm missing something, but I, I'm not really sure how like, they detect the release of a proton um, to differentiate between the bases that are incorporated. Like how again, you add one base at Oh, because you want them to Base again, each time, yeah. You add one base at a time. Okay. Yeah. Th you're not adding four, uh, four bases together. Yeah. That is the basic idea there. Because you are stopping that reaction there at one base. Right? Okay, then 
now the, the creation of the multiple wells, now 10 million wells, 15 million wells, 20 million wells to make it you know, much cheaper and faster. Because if you increase the wells, it becomes faster and cheaper. So what do we do that now? So that means that we have to move beyond now these wells concept. Right? What do we do? Any idea? What do we do? No wells. Remove those wells. What do we do by removing the wells? Right? So what do we do removing the wells? That's what people are thinking again. Good ideas. Before doing that, let me go through the third one example. Right? What we can do, sequencing. We talked about the pyrophosphate release. We talked about the hydrogen ion release. Now we can also detect the uh, binding of the uh, oligonucleotide. No, uh, the addition of the oligonucleotide to the growing strand. Right? So how do we do that? If you want to detect this on this addition of this, there should be um, termination of the reaction. Right? Or you have to add one at a time. If you add one at a time, then also you can detect. But if you want to make it faster, I want to add four at a time. Because one at a time, if I add a, a section of my entire wells or whatever gets illuminated, I want all wells to illuminate. I want to detect, I want to do sequencing in all wells, not the part of those wells. So the ter then you have to go back to Sanger. We can't get rid of Sanger all the time, still. The idea here was, let us do Sanger type. You know, we'll let us add um, fluorophore here. Let us block this elongation. But let us not do dideoxy type, where it is permanent. Let us add some chemical here, which is reversible, like you know, chip type. You know, you made a protein DNA interactions, but it is reversible at high temperature. Same thing, you made it reversible. You add this, it is blocked, remove those blocks, and then start again. It's called as reversible dye terminator reactions. Okay, we will, we will discuss this, who used this technique and how we are using the technique, and right now, what kind of uh, technologies we are using, using this particular chemistry, right? This is what is the dye termination. This is the fluorophore here. You have the chemical block here. Once you add that reaction, you remove, and then you remove this block and add another, uh, another um, um, nucleotide. Okay, and that is what you do. What you do is you take this primer, add the, re, uh, the nucleotide, rinse and image this fluorescence, unblock it, and then add second one and go through one after the other. When you do that, every well you can add all the four nucleotides together not one nucleotide. When you are detecting A and T, in the technology which, which were developed using detection of pyrophosphate and hydrogen, they added one at a time. It was great, fantastic. Still we are using that. But again, you cannot sequence all the wells at the same time. But with this, adding all the nucleotide fluorophores, each, each nucleotide will have a different fluorophore, and then we can do that. We can again do the, actually the same thing. You can add one base at a time. Yes, relatively easier, yes. Is it done to the scale linearly, or? Again, here, home follow is al also it's a problem, it's a less problem, because you can add one at a time, yes, you can do that. You can resolve that issue. Oh, right. I'm sorry, yes. Because you can add that, you, suppose there are ten, 20 a, uh, Ts are here, right. you can, you're adding one T at a time, so it doesn't matter now, right? You can resolve that issue also. Cool idea, right? Right? We can do this now. There you can add all the wells, but now simultaneously, along with that, the well is also a limitation. Now you remove the limitation of adding one base at a time, sequencing partial <coughs> wells. Now you can sequence in all the wells. But if you do that all the wells, but well, wells in themselves are the limitation. You can't go beyond one or two million. You want to go 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 million. You want to go maximum. Is there shouldn't be any limit. What do you do? You have to get rid of these wells somehow, right? You have to get rid of these wells somehow. So the guys called in you know, Solexa earlier, the technology is there. They said that why can't we remove those wells and then use, if you look into the fields, have you anybody gone anywhere southern part of US saw on the corn fields? Did you see corn fields, anybody? Or lawns in front of houses? Right? What do you see? 
all those <coughs> plants are not in the ditch as well, they are all one after the other. They are layered, right? In the lawn outside also, you layer. The grass is layered, right? So instead of putting that those strands in, in a well, beads, remove the beads, or stick those oligos as a layer, as a lawn, like in the corn field or wheat field. Each one is individual, right? But each one, you know, if you layer, you can accommodate more in a surface area. You can get more, isn't it? Cool idea, right? Simple idea again. Instead of well, let us have a layer, right? That's exactly it was thought. And instead of this one, you add this layer. You can take a surface. Instead of well, you now here, you stick this oligonucleotide, synthetic oligonucleotide. Right? It becomes you now part of this sequencing now, synthetic oligonucleotide sticking at the board then of your 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 read or your, your DNA strand. And then you can keep adding these bases. That's why I told you that the dioxy terminator uh, is the terminator, uh, reversible terminator sequence. And then you can add many more. There are no wells here. Right? This is how it looks. So if you get this chip, you prepare a chip. These are these the chip. If there are tell eight na different um, uh, uh, lanes are there, as we call it, there are tunnels. And each tunnel, if you magnify, that's how it looks. There are two synthetic strands, A and B, at the both the ends. You stick them and create a layer instead of well, right? And then that's how you sequence that. You can stick this DNA strand on this layer and then start sequencing this. Right? How do you do that? You can take the DNA here, cut it into small pieces, put these two adapters, A and B on this, and amplify a bit, right, to increase more amount, and then stick it, and then sequence to the layer. Isn't it simple? Right? These are the layers here. You are sticking those, when you push those samples here, these are the layers, and then you stick onto this. And then sequence. <coughs> How many you can sequence now instead of 1 million? These guys started, they said 5 million we can sequence. That was a big deal. Suddenly, five-fold increase. <laughs> 5 million we can sequence in that one. And I showed you that, you know, that chip. There are eight different slots. They call it lanes because there's a line. It looks like a line. 5 million was a big deal because of evolution. And these guys started improving on that. Right now, how many we can sequence in that one slot? Right? How many? Any idea? Approximately. You can go up to 350 million. From 1 million sequencing, we can sequence up to in one slot, small chip slot of this size, like a microscopic slide, literally of that slide. We can have three slots on that, like a gel. There's eight slots on that, like a gel. And then each one, we can sequence up to 350 million. Strands, oligos, strands of DNA. Each strand, suppose if you sequence <coughs> 200 base, and all those strands, using that reversible dye terminator, adding all the four oligonucleotides, we can sequence all of them at the same time. If you add only one, part of those you can sequence at the same time. But if you add all four, you can sequence all of them at the same time. 350 million strands, you can sequence base by base, all of those strands at the same time. Hmm? So That's right. We sequence suppose 200. So you can. Sure yeah. Okay. 100 you can sequence in one end. You can sequence another 100 from another end. You can go up to 300, 150, 150. Let us, for mathematics sake, simple mathematics sake, we are sequencing suppose 200. 100 from this end, 100 from this end. Okay. So 200 you are sequencing. So can you do math? Simple, quick math. Anybody? No calculators, please. 350 million multiplied by 200. 35 into 2, 70, 70 billion. You can sequence 70 billion bases in that one slot. There are eight slots on a one chip. Okay, 70 billion. What is the human genome? 3 billion. 70 divided by 3? 22, 23? Right? 
So 23 human genomes you can sequence in one slot at one X coverage, right? So in that one slot you can sequence one human genome into 20 X coverage or 23 X coverage. Cool, simple. And then they are created the machine which can have 18, 16 of these slots, 16 human genomes. How much time it takes? One week. 13 years, $2.7 billion, right? How much it costs? It costs something around between 1500 to 5000 nowadays, right? So that's how we moved from 2005 to 2016. But when we go in detail about this, little bit understand this, how this high throughput was developed, how this conceptually, you know, there is, it's, it's a very beautiful concept that people develop this. So that's why let's, let's, let's spend, spend some time on that. Same thing like, 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 like a beads. If you stick it to each one here, then when you get this fluorescence, it is too weak to detect. So we have to, if you could clone, that means we can clone this, each single strand. And when you clone this, you know, increase, and like this, there are bunches, it's called as clusters. If you know, in terminology, they'll say in our clusters, yeah. Yes, you have to add the adapters. No, you don't know that. But that's why you, uh, you do the random shearing of the genome. And when you do the random shearing of the genome, then you can add adapters and then it makes sure that the 300 million represents the entire human genome. Uh, nope, you should get 100%. So how do you do that? Is the number number theory, number mathematics? Suppose if you take 3 billion human genomes, right? 3 billion bases, you break that into 200 base pairs. Right? 3 billion divided by 200 is how much? How much? Right? It comes to around 30, 35 million. You make 35 million strands. Right? But you are sequencing 350 million here, 10 times more. And then 35 million, one cell. If you have 10 cells, and that one cell will contain 5 picogram of DNA. You start with, suppose, one microgram of DNA. Huge number of cells. Huge number of genomes on that. It's the same cell, but per cell genome, number of genomes are more. It's not, it's not 1x or 2x. 2x is per cell. If you take 1,000 cells, it is like uh, 2000x, right? Practically in our sense. From that, if you are extracting 350, statistically you are representing the entire human genome by several fold, several x, right? That will take another you know, half an hour class to explain all those numbers. And then that also tells you, you must have heard PCR duplicate, right? So those numbers will help you to understand what exactly is PCR duplicate. Okay, but that is a different one. Some other time when we meet, we can discuss on that. Okay? So that is how you do these clones, and then you increase the signal, and then that's how you, you, you sequence. Okay? That's what you do. It's called as it makes the bridges between these two. That's what I call it the bridge amplification. Now I'm introducing some terminology which is popularly used when you do that bridge amplifications, clusters, and then when you sequence from one end to other, in the bioinformatics people, they call it as a read because they are reading one sequence. They call it as a read. So you are, you are sequencing from uh, this to this end, they say there's a read number one. If you're sequencing from this end to this end, they call it read number two. It's called as a single end, it's called as a paired end, reads. You know, when we're analyzing the DNA, you, can, you, know, you know, there's a seek data, you know about this, you know, single end and paired end reads, right? So this is how the terminology comes from. Right? These are the clusters. So that means, the, this is very interesting. If you are sequencing single end reads, that means that you are sequencing, suppose you are sequencing, we say that the bioinformatics person or anybody say that I have a million reads or 100 million reads. I'll ask, single end or paired end? Because it's important. If I say single end, that means that I have sequenced 100 million strands. 
if they say this 100 million paired end, that means I sequenced only 50 million strands. Okay, when you're looking at the, the depth, is it like more DNA, uh, sequencing more bases is important for you or sequencing more strands is important for you? Right? So that's what you have to decide as a researcher, biologist. And that's what when you talk about analysis or uh, depth, you have to see depth is in terms of more bases per uh, strand or more strands per genome in a given sample. Okay, these are important, that's why there are important terminologies to understand. Reads versus clusters, single read and read versus paired and reads, and what kind of, what it means if you say depth. Is it sequence depth or is it the strand depth? Number of strands. Okay, and again, I'm coming back to that. Same technology, you can again go reversible terminator, add that, wash it, remove that, and then again add, keep on going, keep on going. Right now we can do at one end, we can do up to 100 base pairs with accuracy. Errors increase, but we can go up to 150 base pairs, one end, another uh, end, 150 base pairs. 300 you can sequence. If you are getting 300 million, suppose, and if you are sequencing 300 bases at the 300 million reads per lane, you are getting 90 billion uh, bases you are sequencing. 90 billion bases comes to around 30x human genome, and that is what is a standard depth of sequencing today. That means in one slot, you can sequence 30x entire human genome. That is the today's capacity, okay? So how does that work? So that is how these are the clusters. In the molecular biology term, we call them clusters. Each cluster fluoresces when you add the bases, right? And then the computer on that, depending on the ex em emission wavelength, which is specific for ATGC, it, 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 it analyzes that, it's called as base calling. It, it determines that particular intensity is A, this intensity here on this is B, you know, G, C, T, like that, and then it makes the sequence. Okay, it adds that one after the other, and then, and then you align that, because you have the 350 million shock pieces, 200, 200, 200 base pairs, now you have to use the computer, supercomputer, that's what you are learning in other classes. You align the whole thing and make a big strand, and then you have 30x, all the 30 strands you, you know, stack one over the other, and now you see what are the variations in that entire genome. Indels, SNPs, right? Is it a real error, or is it uh, error during sequencing, or is it a real mutation? Is it insertions, inversions, uh, translocations, whatever you want to discuss, analyze, understand, you can do that. Uh, to do that, that is how you generate that sequence, and then you get the biologically meaningful results from that. That could be in research or that could be in, in, in medical uh, treatment. Clear? So what can we do with this sequencing? This is the sequencing technology I explained to you. We, we developed those. What we can do with these sequencing technologies now? I told you, right, when we were first human genome was sequenced, what can we do with that? We developed the microarray technology. I can say that you know, we can do A, B, C, D, E with that. What can we do with that? We can sequence the whole or targeted genome. We can sequence the whole exome, that is the coding sequences we can sequence. We can sequence the entire genome, or you can sequence a part of that genome. That part of the genome could be only coding sequences. It could be certain number of coding sequences. It could be only promoters, whatever you want to sequence. How do we do that? Again, question mark, right? Sequencing a whole transcript on all the RNAs which are expressed. There are 30,000 genes are there which express the coding sequences. You can sequence all of them. Uh, I don't know how many of those 30,000 are expressed in a particular given cell type, maybe 10,000 on an average. What are those? We can do that. We can also sequence the chromatome chip seek that I explained to you, that chip seek when, when I added the first 70 spots, now you can do 350 million strands. You can sequence and then see where those transcription factor binds or where the histones are modified. And then you can also sequence the non-coding RNA. Right? There's a huge non-coding transcriptome is there, yes. So what are the limitations? Let's discuss. Let's discuss after this. Let's discuss about the what we can do, and then let us discuss what we can do, right? And then i have explained to you what, what you can do now. If you are sequencing entire human genome, what is simple, take the human genome, break it into pieces again. People are asking me how to do that adapters. Put those adapters here, both the ends, amplify those, and then sequence them, layer them on that slide, you know, on that one lane, and then sequence it. Align that sequence, go over into bioinformatics, and then get your entire human genome and then study its variation. Is there a particular, I mean, there are millions of protocols to share your DNA. Is there something like authentication, or is there a different sort of enzyme, or how do we share? 
How do they? Acoustic shearing. Acoustic shearing is the best, according to me, because you take the sound waves, ultrasonic sound waves, and then shear the DNA into small bases. Depending on the time and their intensity, uh, you can do that. It's very popular. It was developed. Now, there's some companies are coming up with the enzymatic shearing. They say that you can use certain enzymes. You don't have to buy that machine. Use that enzyme, you get cuts. But again, there's a concern whether there is a um, cutting is whether it is random or whether it is there is a selection in during the sites or during the cutting. But they claim that you know it is as random as the acoustic shearings. But again, it depends. Some people, if you could spend money on buying that machine, which is around 100 k or so, then you can have that, and then you can do acoustic shearings. That is the best, or you can go to enzymatic shearing. So and then suppose you do that. And now you want to do a sequence the coding sequences. How do you do? Start thinking. How do you do coding sequences? Entire human genome. 3GB, let's go a haploid one. 1.5% of that is uh, coding sequences. How much it comes to? 45 million. 1.5 into 3 million, right? 45 million. So 45 megabases of that entire 3 billion are the coding, uh, are the genes, coding genes, coding regions. So I don't want to sequence 3 billion. It's too much for me, too much of money. It's a big problem to analyze the whole thing. I just want to sequence the coding regions, mutations that coding regions. Try to understand that. So how do I do that? Right? So no technology, even if it gets outdated, it is like, you know, uh, it is useless forever. No. Right? Even microarray, you say that, you know, after microarray, we have moved to this technology. We cannot get rid of that. Even if you move this to this technology, we use the die terminator complex com concept using in the Sanger's development, but we made it reversible instead of permanent. But here also now, go back to microarray. Use this hybridization technique. Right? What do you do? You have the human genome, right? And then the human you prepare the library from that human genome, and then you develop this bead-based these arrays here, right? These oligonucleotide, which make the oligonucleotide which represent only the coding sequences, coding genes. Okay? And hybridize that using these bitonated beads, pull it down. You are pulling down only these coding regions of the gene, only exons of the gene. Is it clear? Right? Only exons you pull it down from that. 3 billion you pull it down, you know, 645 uh, MB gene, and then sequence it. Right? So it will be, if you are sequencing the 45 MB, if you are sequencing at 100X coverage, it will be 4.5 GB of the data. Right? 4.5 GB. But you are sequencing around 90 GB, that one lane. You are at 100X, 4.5 GB, it is uh, too much of sequencing for that exome. So less sequence you are do doing sequencing. So you can pool many samples in one slot now. What you can do? You can put a molecular barcode. Again, in that synthetic one, you can put another synthetic, very specific nucleotide sequence, six, seven, eight base pairs, as a molecular barcode, and you can pull more samples. It becomes more and more cheaper. You can do it at a few hundred dollars. You can, you can do the exome sequencing at 40x. 500 bucks, cheap, right? So from genome, you do the exome. So what if I want to sequence the RNA? Right? Same thing. You convert this into cDNA, fragment it, attach these again adapters here. The same concept, differential display concept, which we added the Y-shaped adapters. Same thing you are using this over and over again. Add those adapters, very important, essential, because you have to stick this. And you have to use, stick, use one to stick to that lawn. Use another one as a primer, design primer for uh, sequencing. Right? So this is what you do. And then you align and then uh, study. So what else you can do? You can also do a chip. I explained to you earlier that you know you use the formaldehyde, and then you pull it down, get these strands instead of microarray, add these adapters, and then sequence entire human genome. At nucleotide, you get the nucleotide level, re uh, level resolution. There, you know at that 50 base pair somewhere it is there, right? Or 100 base pair somewhere it is uh, each nucleotide, nucleotide resolution you get single nucleotide. That is the maximum resolution that we can get from the human genome or transcriptome. It is real molecular biology at the molecular level information we are getting. 
right? So this is what we can do along with that. So what are the technologies which we discussed today? The second generation, this is called as a second generation because the Sangers is the first generation. We detected the 454. We use this. This is now this company is defunct. It may be in, in the museums now because it's gone from market because this technology is dominating and this is also is used use because it's a faster. And then this technology uses the um, phosphate as a detection system. This technology uses the hydrogen ion release as a detection system. And then this uh, technology uses the uh, fluorescently labeled base, addition of the base as a detection system. Okay? So we have generated the seq data of the different ways. This is how you get the sequence data, different format. Okay? And then when we do that, what do you do? You take the reference genome and then align these, all these bases. When you, know, when you come to the bioinformatics side, you must have learned it yesterday. You will be learning it in the afternoon, tomorrow. So this is what you'll be doing. Conceptually, why we have need to do all those, all those things which we do on the computers using HPC? Because this is not an easy task. It requires a very high-end computing system. That's why it requires the supercomputing system to do this. All the time, routinely, we have to do this. We cannot take, again, 10 years to align one human genome. We, got, we could sequence it in one week or to uh, five days, but you should not take you know, one year or 10 years to align this. We have to make faster computers, more powerful computers which can also align within hours, in a day or minutes to do it faster. That is how the computer technology has to catch up with this molecular biology. It's a competition now. The molecular biology caught up. I can sequence it faster now. Can the computation can come up? Yes, computing technology is de being developed, but not for this. They are dealing for other applications, but you are using that ca capacity here. But what is important is that can you develop the scripts, those algorithms, to do it faster, give me accurate information. Tomorrow, don't say, oops, that whatever information I give it is wrong. It's an artifact of analysis. It should not be the case. That's why there is a lot of uh, efforts to develop computing technologies. That's why you are trying to understand the computer languages. But the time should come wherein, because to use the Facebook or Twitter, you don't have to understand the computer language or computer. You don't have the compu or computer geek. Anybody can use that. Similarly, anybody, in a any biologist or anybody or a clinician should be in a position to use these analysis technologies pools in future. So that is a different story. But here, whatever is available here now, that we are using this reference genome to align, right? And then get one big long strand. And then why we require the depth of the sequencing? Because the sequencing, whatever you see the errors, if you see only one strand, if you sequence one X, whatever m m mutations or indels you see, they could be genuine or they could be a mistakes during the sequencing. That happens. So how do you detect that? That's why you have to sequence many, many times. Same human sequence you sequence many, many times. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Initially, people did many, several times. They see what is enough. What is enough? In a human genome, they say 30x is enough. But uh, exome, they say, depending on what you want, you can go from 40x to 200x. Right? So if you sequence here, suppose 30x, suppose. I don't know how many there are. Suppose, suppose there are 30 here. Suppose if there is t here, and this t, instead of t now, there is a c here. So you see the C in all the strands that we sequenced. That means it is genuine. But if you see here, T instead of C here, in one of the particular strands, not all strands, in some of the strands, that means it is an error. Suppose, suppose by mistake, suppose by chance we sequence only this genome, only one X, which happens to be this. You mistake this as a mutation. Right? That's why you have to sequence many times. That's why you get the depth, what depth I want. Then you have to tell the depth of the sequencing to make sure that to get more and more accurate information. Right? That's why you require depth of sequencing. Okay? And then you can align that. Based on that alignment, you can get different type of information. If you align everywhere, no event, wild type, great, wonderful. If you, uh, there is a deletion, it aligns, but there is no alignment here in this region. That means that region doesn't exist in that particular genome. There is a deletion here. If there is an insertion, you align too many reads at one particular region here. Okay? So that's an insertion there. So same thing, you can have no event here. This is the uh, read coverage, and then this is the single end, and this is the paired end reads. When you uh, align the new sequence, suppose only one base pair, one end, if you sequence both the ends, the alignment, when you align the data, you have the little bit difference in the analysis pattern, but you can get the beautiful information, all types of non-event, deletions, insertions, 
and inversions from the both types. Okay, I can do. You can do the paired end alignment or single end alignment. Yes. So the reference uh, uh, space of post two cannot have insertion. Hmm. But the reference space uh, approach, if you mapping to the reference genome, you cannot detect uh, insertion because your your rib cannot map to the. Right. That is why the reference genome is a problem because uh, that is a de novo assembly you have to do for that. Yes. That's a little bit deeper. I was giving only basic concept of how do you do analysis, what kind of information you get by, by analysis. Okay? Just clear here? So what you do, do you when, when you do the analysis, when you open the computer in different classes and different times, there are different types of and the computing people came into this sequencing field in the biology. Suddenly a new branch of uh, the science deal is called as bioinformatics because the analysis developing the tools for the analysis of this, D of this DNA, RNA, or chip DNA, or different varieties, and trying to get more and more information. And different um, tools were developed, different tools are being developed, and those tools are being uh, you know, taught. And that's what you are in this, in this summer school. You are learning our different tools, and this is the reason behind that. This is what the molecular biologists do, develop these techniques, and this is how computers came into being. So you have these ma mapping tools, and you have to map it, right? And then variant analysis tools. And if you map it, you have to detect those variants. So variants analysis tool, popular one is the GATK. And then mapping tools are BWA. Indel analysis, there are different tools to identify indels. And then you have the for the RNA-seq. You have this uh, top hat or star alignments to align the transcriptome, right? And then uh, couplings, you know, differential express, how many uh, RNA um, transcripts or per gene are expressed to understand the level of expression. Uh, there are on that, and then if you have ch uh, chip seek, and there are different techniques where you know the, the, the analysis methods were developed. Uh, or some of the popular ones are Max, which is being used now. The earlier one was the Peak Seek, where you know, like an RNA, that if you sequence this particular re region of the of immunoprecipitation, it is highly enriched during your sequencing. That shows that the, the transcription factor is binding to that region. Okay, that's how you analyze. And then more and more tools will develop. Now more tools, more specific. Specifically, can you identify all the variants? Can you identify all? So what I was telling was, I given examples of different types of sequencing and analysis of the data of those different uh, sequencing types, right? So we can develop more and more, more improvements we can do faster, more accurate information we can get from these. From these, that's how you will get more and more. And now. You do the pipelines, you know, you have a galaxy here. All of them can be put into one web page. You can use all at the same time. You can develop platforms. And then uh, you can also share this information between the labs. There are portals to do that, so on and so forth, right? And you can use your own computer. Now, uh, you know, base space is there from the Illumina. You can have cloud computing to do this on the clouds if you don't have your own supercomputer. So different things are being developed during the analysis of the data which is being generated by the brilliant, brilliant work by these uh, molecular biologists. Do you accept? Do you agree? Right? So what else we can do with this? Right? What it, it did, it had a, had a huge impact on the research. It, I have listed it here. Let us not go through in detail because you know already that instead of sequence genome, genome-wide you can do, we can discuss in detail. Can you read this slide and then understand or impact like in a whole genome level, whole transcriptome level, whole chromatome, chromatome level you can uh, you know, investigate a particular cell. You can also go for low levels, microarray. You cannot think of doing single cell. Now you can think of doing single cells, right? Take one cell, sequence its genome. Take one cell, sequence its transcriptome. Look at the variety, for example, in an organ, for example. Like, you know, if I take a kidney, for example, right? In the kidney, you have kidney cells. You know, whether individually, how those cells, do they, all the cells, do they express same amount of RNA? Or whether there is any heterogeneity in that, and uh, how that heterogeneity is, is 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 it good or bad? Is it used to make one homogeneous function of the organ? So different kind of things you can use that, and that knowledge can be used how that in a pathology how those cells different cells behave. Uh, that single cell sequencing can do with that, and also you can develop a different branch of uh, medicine called genomic medicine. How we do that, we can we can briefly you know, go over that before we take a break. Okay, so. Currently, what we are doing with this, using the sequencing technology in medical field, right? These are the, some of the stuff which we are doing here at Mount Sinai and elsewhere also they are be, being done. 
One is that we can use all s one screen for all known genetic disorders. So far, there was one, one test for one genetic disorder. Thalassemia, one test, you know, uh, alkaptonuria, one test. You know, they used to collect the blood from the infant and then do one test for a you know, known for 10, 15 diseases. But there are almost right now, we know around 300 Mendelian disorder genes are known. We can take the genome of that infant. We can just do one sequencing, do analysis, and tell uh, wh where are the homozygous, compound heterozygous, or the heterozygous mutations are there from that screen, right? Or the, the adults also we can do. It's called as carrier screening. If somebody is born to become parents, and then we can sequence their genome and say that you are heterozygous or the carrier for the same disease, then they can have, they can understand what are the chances that the baby will have, will have a homozygous mutation or the heterozygous mutation, right? So the carrier screening. So we can also do the non-invasive prenatal testing because the, the, uh, the mothers to be the pregnant uh, patients, they have uh, fetal DNA in their blood, which is around a mononucleosomal amount of DNA, which is around 150 base pairs. So you can isolate that DNA and then you can sequence that and then you can understand what is happening in the fetal, like a trisomy, you can detect instead of going through the invasive techniques, right, which, is, which, are, which are really risky. You can do that. We can, uh, we can diagnose and treat, and treat uh, clinically undiagnosed diseases we can treat. Sometimes there is no clinically, I don't know what is happening with this, with this patient, with this baby or whatever. So that we can ultimately sequence the genome, try to understand are there any mutations, any pathways mutated, can we develop new, new technique, we can do that. The precision medicine, we can do the targeted therapy, right? And then we can give an example, personalized medicine, pathogen surveillance, we can take the swaps or different places in the hospitals, and then try to see what kind of a bacteria are present here, right? There could be a weather map, like a pathogen map will be there, microbial map will be there, or they will come, and the entire New York City, there will be a pathogen map. Suddenly they will say, today, uh, Salmonella is here in these areas, don't go. That kind of a situation will come. No? Uh, that we can do that, and then education and training, that's what we are doing it here, right? And that's what we are doing at Mount Sinai. So just quickly go through before we take the break here, so a test case, we did that in initially long back. We a test case, we did how to do the precision diagnosis, right? So that means what? There are many di disorders which are multigenic. That is not multigenic, so monogenic maybe, but there are spectrum disorders, for example, autism. There could be different types of uh, mental disorders are put together as autism. Autism is not one particular uh, solid one kind of a, a, a disorder, right? There are varieties of disorder put under as autism disorders. There are some things, there are many like that. Thalassemia are different genes are involved in that. So there is one of those spectrum disorders is uh, neuroacanthocytosis. These disorders, these are the motor diseases. You know, the motor, if you clinically want to diagnose, it has to come to the very terminal stage where depending on the movement uh, changes and depending on the movements which are known in the advanced stage of the disease, then clinically you can diagnose and then you can start patient, but it's too late, right? So can we do that? By sequencing, can we identify what exactly is that? Out of those five, six diseases in that spectrum disease, can we identify exactly what disease, disease is there so that we can start treatment early? So to see whether we can do that, we started working on this around 2010 or 11, and then we, thought we took this, this case, and there was a patient, there were two patients, which had clinically you know, advanced stages, and then we, they, had, they were diagnosed as having a chorea akinthocytosis, this is uh, one of those many several diseases, several of these uh, diseases which fall under these uh, motor, motor diseases, okay? We selected these two patients which were clinically diagnosed. When we sequenced these, these the two patients of the entire exome and we sequenced it, uh, when we sequenced the entire, uh, these patients, they were found to have the compound heterozygote mutations only in this, uh, in this gene which is associated with the chorea akinthocytosis, okay? Not with other genes. That means once you start getting little bit of symptoms more, more immediately you can sequence, look where the mutation is. You can, before it can come to that late stage of the clinical uh, development, immediately you can detect that or diagnose that disease at the very base level and then start early treatment. And that is possible. That's what we did as a test case. We, uh, then we can say that it is possible to detect the any kind of a disease much early and then start doing treatment or manage the diseases much earlier. Okay, that's an advantage. That is the precision diagnosis, okay? And then another case where we worked on this was the undiagnosed disease. There, is a, there are many cases, you must have seen that the, uh, the, the, the babies or the adults, they come 
doctors clinically say, I just, we just can't diagnose what's going on here, right? So can we diagnose that? There's one particular case, it became very popular it, in 2009, as early as 2009, when we, we were, everything was new. There was a baby here, that time I was in, I was in Yale, and then a case came in the genetics department because they were working with some uh, Turkish people there, uh, in some collaborations. And then a, a case came from Turkey. They said that we have an infant baby which wets the diaper all the time. Okay, dehydration, huge dehydration, wetting the diaper all the time. And then urologists looked into that, no problem, they couldn't detect anything. And then the um, kidney experts came, they looked into that, nephrologists, they came, they couldn't detect anything. They were not able to diagnose the what's going on with this baby. But again, all the time, the diapers are wet. And then they contacted the, the Yale, Yale uh, researchers. They said, can you do something about that? Because uh, we heard that you, know, you are developing new technologies. They said, send the DNA. So we got the gDNA, and then we did the exome sequencing. When we did that, we found the mutation in this particular gene, which is associated with the chloride diarrhea. Okay? The baby could not you know, absorb the ions. So the wetting diaper was not through the kidney or the uh, urethra, but it was through the bowel, <laughs> through the gastrointestinal tract, right? And they said, this is the mutation here. Give the, the, for this classical treatment is salt treatment. You give alternate salts, you give, they gave it, baby was fine. It got cured, right? And then now many more examples, cases are there. You must be heard in newspapers, it came many times everywhere that we can do this, use this sequencing technology for the undiagnosed diseases we can do. There's an ultimate kind of uh, uh, diagnosis that we can do and then we have this experience, we have done that. So for the diagnosis, what we are doing here, we are doing carrier screenings, right? We are also doing uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, right? And also uh, we, uh, we are also doing this as early as we can do in nine weeks of the uh, gestation and then this is a very big, uh, huge, um, benefit for the patients. Along with that, we can do the personalized therapy. What is that personalized therapy? For example, if you are treating cancer, what do you do while treating cancer? You know, there are huge amount of the clinical trials are made, but hundreds of thousands of people. Then we have the drugs specific for lung cancer. These are drugs specific for you know, tip, you know, brain cancer, lung cancer, blood cancer. There are drugs associated with different cancers. We, can, we have developed those uh, different drugs which can, uh, which can target the uh, the, the signal pathways target the oncogenes, they target the DNA synthesis or cell proliferation, and then we treat them. But again, we know that you know, it works to some people, some people they, it doesn't work, that's how it is. But what we can do now is that in a tumor patient, we can get the tumor, tumor RNA, tumor DNA, and then the normal germline DNA. We can sequence it, analyze that data, and then see which pathways are altered in that. Which mutations are there? Are there only one oncogene is there? Is there any oncogene mutated? Is there any cell surface receptor is mutated? Is there any known classical mutation? Is there P53, but what else is mutated there? Okay, here in this case, kinase pathway is affected. This particular kinase pathway is affected. This particular receptor is affected. VGF receptor is affected. Or in this particular case, now you have additional some mutations are there, additional some pathways are affected. When you detect that, you can get that and create that model into the flies. The fly has a very beautiful genetic uh, test system. It has all those basic epithelia or other stuff, uh, tissue like a humans, and then we can create those mouse in the mouse, or you can take these cells and grow them in the culture. And then whatever available drugs are there in the market, you can take those drugs and then take the combination of those drugs and then develop a new combination which targets all these mutations which you found in that particular tumor. Otherwise, you will be treating one particular mutation type which is predominant, predominantly detected in several of those clinical trials or several of those patients. But that particular patient will have that normal common uh, mutation. Also, that patient will have additional mutations which is specific to that tumor, right? So we can develop those combinations by detecting that and we can give that treatment to that patient. That becomes a personalized therapy, right? Uh, also, we can do, after doing that therapy treatment or classical treatment, we can also monitor, we can also take the uh, DNA from the uh, cell-free DNA from the blood and we can monitor uh, the, if the, if you know the, if you develop the biomarkers which are associated with that particular tumor type, once you do the treatment to re recurrence of the tumor, when the tumor reoccurs, 
when you look at clinical, that's too late sometimes. So if you can start doing it, if you develop the markers, if you know that which DNA is, is released in the blood, which mutated DNA for that particular cell type, you can start sequencing at the earlier intervals and then look for the emergence of that DNA. If you get it much earlier, clinically there is no symptom, but in the blood you are seeing that DNA come in. So immediately you can intervene there, right? Those kind of things, precision diagnosis and personalized treatment is possible because of that just sequencing is faster and quicker and cheaper because it is affordable also. And again, if you look into any drug, any time somebody's we are taking Tylenol you take, Advil you take, I take, all of us take. So what is a hit and trial? You just go and pick up one, you know, pop one pill. If it you know, helps a headache, fine. If not, you take another pill, right? It is out of the, uh, 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 over the counter, it is fine. So the doctors also do the same thing, right? So this is the reason, because we have this population. We do a clinical trial. Certain drug works for all these you know, green colored patients, majority of the patients. But there are some few who are excluded from this. They don't respond. Some, they don't respond for some, this drug is toxic actually. Because of the mutations in the P450 system, metabolism or the different metabolites are made. So how do you do that? So every individual, if you sequence the genotyping, DNA preemptive genotyping, everybody's DNA database is there in the hospital. Along with your clinical uh, records, you, they match it with this, aha, there is a mutation in a gene, P450 gene, which poorly metabolize, metabolizes the plavix. Okay, that's why Plavix stays in the system a long time and it causes toxicity. Don't give this drug to this patient. Give them something else, different, alternate therapy. Or warfarin, blood thinner, right? If it is not metabolizing properly, that creates problem because it can, it can, you, you start, patient will start bleeding because it cannot metabolize faster. Sometimes they metabolize slower, sometimes they metabolize faster. Anesthesia drugs, if they are metabolized faster, patient will wake up early, right? So all those things, we can standardize those doses. We can determine which is toxic, which is not toxic, doing this genome sequencing, right? Understanding what type of a genome, whatever genes you, are, you want to analyze and then create a database. So this is what is important. This is what, that's why this simple technology has developed a new branch of medicine called genomic medicine. And this, in Mount Sinai, we are doing all these, uh, these activities here, okay? So, We'll take a break, I think, right? And then we will see what next. Just to get, uh, discuss a little more on this uh, last uh, segment, right? So far, interesting? Is it interesting? Okay. We can do more. We can talk more. Okay, good. So next what? Again, every time, you know, I describe something, some new advancements, and then I say that what next, right? So. We had a great technologies like you now from first human genome to microarrays, great, and then we thought that this is great, but still we need something more. And then we did that, and then that is great. What else? What next, right? So what, they're all great things are there in the next generation sequencing. What we cannot do, right? We can't, what we can't do with this second generation sequencing. So we can't do, we can't, we, we cannot, cover GC-rich regions. It's difficult to cover GC-rich regions with the second generation sequences, right? And then amplification bias. There are PCR duplicates we have to encounter depending on the samples, right? And then uh, have practical limits in read length. We can go up to maximum 300 base pairs. And one read is only 150 base pairs maximum uh, from, the, from the Illumina is high throughput. Uh, we can go not more than that. Right, that is a problem because if you know, have you heard about line elements? Have you heard about ALU line elements repeats? Right, those repeats range from 250 base pair to 500 base pair to several KB. Right, if you are sequencing maximum 150 base pairs, and then suppose your mutation is there in particular ALU or the line element, which line element is that? You know, around that gene, there could be some 50 line elements will be there around that gene and you detected one very significant mutation in that uh, line element or ALU element, where does that lie? You can't map that because it's the same read everywhere, right? That becomes a very severe limitation, right? And uh, identification mapping of duplicate genes and pseudogenes because there are pseudogenes are there, there are duplicate genes. Classical example is you have the globin genes. You have the A gamma, G gamma, the fetal gene, you have the um, developmental regulated, you have the a fetal gene, adult gene, and then 
in the most major minor are there in adult gene, they're all like more than 90% homologous. When you sequence find the mutation, you don't know where to map. There are many pseudo genes uh, which are gene like, which are not gene, but they are highly homologous. It's difficult to do that. There are the severe limitations. So, so next is how do we address these limitations? Right? So that means that we have to go beyond high throughput, great, everything is great, it is becoming cheaper. Still, we can make it so cheap that it will be $100 or free, we can do it. Maybe it is the way we are going, it can happen one day. But again, we have to take care, there are the serious uh, scientific uh, issues we have to address. Right? That means that we have to go much more beyond into the development of the sequencing technology. We are not done yet. Right? What it requires to address some of these questions, what it requires is that we have to go beyond the amplification, PCR, number one. We can do that, right? We are also doing in certain cases, but we have to go beyond that. Second is that this, uh, take care of these repeats, how to map the repeats. We have to have the, increase the read length. 150 base pair is not sufficient. We are massively sequencing 300 million. That's why you are able to cover the entire human genome, but you are not really covering entire human genome. Why? You, can, you have to exclude these repeat regions. You cannot map these repeat regions, even though you are sequencing them but you can't map them. It doesn't mean that you are not sequencing. You are sequencing all the repeat regions in the entire human genome, but we cannot map them because of the short read length. Okay, so that means that you have to go for longer read lengths. Read length should be longer, as long as possible. How long? Limitation, how long? If you ask me, how long do you think the read length should be? 1,000 basis, 2,000 basis, 3,000 basis, 5,000, 10,000? If you ask me, sequence the entire chromosome without breaking it. I think that is my, for me, that is an ultimate read. Okay? No adapter ligation, nothing. Take the entire chromosome, separate it, make it into DNA, and then sequence that. I think that is the ultimate read length. No mapping is necessary, nothing is necessary, right? You can do that. So that is the ultimate one. But what can we do right now? Right? That is the ultimate goal. What, can we, <coughs> what we can do? So that there are people who are thinking on that. And then same thinking went on, and then now we are seeing two technologies which are coming up, which are taking care of this issue of going for the longer read length and then faster sequencing. Okay, one is called as the Pacific Biosystems Tag Bio, another called as the Nanopore, which is a different technology. Okay, we can briefly go through this and then see how fascinating these are, how the fascinating people are thinking in a different ways, completely different ways, conceptually, how they are doing that. So, if you have you heard of these technologies, any of you? No, not much really. You heard, yeah. So some, many not, many have not heard. So it's good, good, good to discuss and go through that. For some, it will be repeat, good repetition, right? We can we can just go through again. It's like a revision for many of you. Okay. So the Pacific Bio System guys, what they did now? Now the concept now here is, <coughs> for all these technology, what you saw. It's all snapshots, you know, you can take pictures, snapshots, you can scan, right? You can take a snapshot. When you add the base to that fluorescence base, take a picture of that. When you add that long 350 million, you can't take picture, then you scan. People started scanning it, right? Initially, when 454 was developed, and initially when these Illumina was developed, they were taking snapshots, you know, shot here, shot here, shot here, snapshots of those oligos. But these read length increased from 5 million to 350 million, there are so many that you cannot take snapshot, it's tough. So they started scanning it, scan the whole thing, you know, from, from snapshot to little bit of movement. Right? They're scanning it. Still, it is a snapshot, but scanning. Now, to increase the read length, again, this, this people thought that why can't, instead of taking snapshots or scanning, why can't you be videotape a biochemical reaction? Have you ever heard of this? Anybody thinking like that? Videotaping a biochemical reaction, right? That means what? As the polymerase is adding bases, right? Let it add bases, no stoppage there. Let it keep adding bases, no one base at a time, no reverse die terminator. Let it keep adding, and I want to take a video of that. In that video, it should say, A is added, G is added, C is added, T is added, A, 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 you know? And I want to videotape that. Isn't it revolutionary? It's a cool concept. It's a good one. Again, big ideas are great. Execution is also important. How do you execute that? 
how do you do that actually? So what you require is you require a robot inside. You do the automatically do the reaction, add everything immediately. You know, you start turn on the camera, do the shooting. Of that reaction, it should be pitch dark inside, right? And the camera should be the good, much better than the Hollywood camera, right? And then start shooting it. Okay, in the tiny wells, on those tiny wells, right? So. What is the most important stuff? Why we did not do this earlier? Why we wanted one base at a time? Why we wanted terminator die, reversible terminator die? We could have done this much earlier, right? People would have thought. Why they didn't do this that time? Because why? Because the reaction is so fast. By the time you take a picture, it's all done, right? That's why you want to add, sit for a while, watch the whole thing, take one picture, I'm done, then you add another one, right? But here the guy says, no, I want to let, let it keep adding. I want to videotape that. I want to take up that challenge. What they have to do now, what we have to do now first to do that, we have to now break a leg of the polymerase. Don't run so fast. Right? If I'm running sprint type, running, by the time I'm looking, you are 100 meter dash, you are done within nine seconds for something. Right? So I want to break one leg Take your own time to go there. You go there, I will allow you to go there, but at my own time, my, my determined time. At a sore pace. Break polymerase leg. That means what? Create mutations in that polymerase. Make sure that the kinetics of the addition of the basis slows down considerably so much that you are now in a position to keep a camera there and then look for the addition of the fluorescence different types of fluorescence there, right? When you do that, you have to remove the fluorescence, right? When it adds fluorescence, if that fluorescence which is adds, it has to remove the fluorescence. You are able to understand what I'm saying without showing any slides, right? So when you add a fluorescence here, like a dye terminator, fluorescence is there on the ring, but you have to remove that fluorescence to add the another fluorescence. But if you are not removing anything now, your bases are being continuously added, you are videotaping, how do you remove that fluorescence? See, all these practical problems are there. Yeah. Why did you make the announcement to use the developed cameras to have a higher frame per second? Higher cap, you can develop the cameras, yes. You have to go to the camera guys. Hey, please, can you develop? Yeah. They'll say, okay, come tomorrow. Maybe it will take one year. What I'm saying is use the available technologies. Yes, the, when the technology they develop, you can also develop here, make changes here. But when we, I am developing something, I will take available other technologies and make best use of those technologies and modify my technology or the chemistry to suit and then get best use of the available technologies, right? So if the, you get the better cameras, of course, we will also change this and it's also good, like computers happen. HPCs came and supercomputers came. Now computer people are now, they got in, wow, there's a business here. You know, we can develop faster ones, faster computing systems, faster chips, so on and so forth, right? So, but here, how do you do that? How do you remove? Again, go back to the basics, go back to the biochemistry. Go back to that basic of that. <coughs> when I, if I could go back, there is that our basic one, oh, wow, this is, this is much earlier, right? Okay. Yes. Yes, go back to basics, right? So we can f put a fluorescence here, right? We are putting fluorescence here, right? Now, if you look into this reaction carefully, when this is here, right? We can add fluorescence here. When this molecule is added, these two are released, right? So now, fluorescence is usually added here. But uh, one guy thought, why can't I add it here? To this phosphate here, last phosphate here. So what is the advantage? When it is added here, during reaction when it is added, it takes a millisecond, right? And after millisecond when it is added, the reaction happens, it breaks and chops off. It is released from here goes into the solution. So you are adding the fluorescence and removing it during the reaction. Agreed? 
right? Great concept, right? Label it here, add it, remove it, it is passed, detect in that time. When it adds, immediately detect, it is released, gone. Next comes, when it added, detect it, it is released, gone. It gets diffused into the, into the solution, and you, you see the diffused fluorescence in the solution, but when it is added, you need the static fluorescence there. You see the fluorescence is static here for a millisecond. And then video is getting, getting you know, it is videotaping. And then you know what type of fluorescent wavelength it is. Multispectral camera is there. Okay? Isn't it cool? So we can videotape. It is possible now. We know how to do that. We know where to label it. And then you have to have a now well in such a way that entire thing, like Hubble type, you know, whole light, it is focused and goes out from one small portion so that it is easier to detect. That's why they call it zero mode wavelength. Some, you know, they gave the name, they created the bells in such a way that whatever fluorescence is there, it is focused way like a laser, it comes out. Not laser, but tight, uh, you know, focused wavelength, it comes out for the camera to detect it. They design smartly designed those, uh, uh, those, those um, cells. They call it smart cells because they have the smart ones, the smart cells. Okay? And then when we do that same thing, add it now. You put it in the wells now, not no lawn here. Wells, good. And then videotaping. By videotaping, they start at initially, it was 2 KB. Now they are going up to average 12 to 15 KB. 12 to 15,000 base pairs you can sequence. It's a long stack. Now if you have 250, 500 base pair line elements are there, you can say where that mutation is based on that. There are some 10, so this is my suppose 12 KB, in that I have 10 line elements or alloy elements. And because I have that alloy element encompassing the, uh, you know, the regular sequence, specific sequence, when you align it, you know where the mutation is. If there are any structural variations in the DNA, or you can see in the entire cDNA, look for the all the splice variations, right? How many exons are, you know, combinations of exons different, you can check that. Different things you can do. That exactly this technology was developed. Just go through that. I have to fast forward these. Yes. That's what. This is the machine. It's a very big one, huge. It is like this from there to here. Why? Because it has that robot inside, that camera. It has to do the reaction by automatically inside. You have to add everything. As soon as it adds, the camera has to move, take the picture. So it is very big, very big and heavy. So this is what it looks like in that every well. And then what happens is that when you do this, if you see the other, other technologies, you are sticking the DNA either to the bead or as a lawn. Right? You are sticking the DNA. And then you are adding polymers in the solution. Right? Because you are whatever it sticks, you have to measure on that, right? On the static one. But now if you do the same thing, if you stick the DNA here, all the polymerase everywhere, that polymerase will go everywhere and then start adding everywhere. So you can't, you can't uh, accurately take the videotape of these uh, DNA molecules. Right? So if you want to videotape a uh, polymerase action, there you are taking the picture of the base addition on the DNA. But here you are doing that, but actually you are trying to videotape the polymerase action. So if you are doing that, you have to immobilize polymerase rather than DNA. Right? If you polymerize rather than DNA, when the DNA goes through it, then you can detect that. Fluorescence, right? Once the DNA goes, second DNA won't come. That's all. That's it. It is sticking to the DNA specific now. Keep working on that DNA. Right? Like that, similarly, the polymerase gets immobilized in those wells. Protein immobilization, have you anybody heard? It's a very fascinating field. Enzyme immobilization. You do enzyme immobilization in the industrial enzymology. Maybe in the industrial reactions, if you do big enzymatic reactions to develop some compounds, biochemical compounds, you do enzyme immobilization. Okay? So you do that immobilization technique, you use it here. Immobilize that and then create an enzyme and then DNA adducts, put it here, start the reaction, and then keep measuring it. 
right? So what you do, actually you are measuring that. So this is how is that the, uh, the zero mode that uh, technique will be there. So you add this fluorescence here. It is labeled on the uh, phosphate molecules of the triphosphate. When it comes here, it is static for a millisecond. Take that video and it is chopped off, cut it in the solution. You have the diffused color fluorescence in the solution. Okay, that camera takes it as a background fluorescence. It gets back into the background fluorescence. This is a specific fluorescence here, and there is a background fluorescence. Okay, very simple reaction. So this is, according to me, this is the first biochemical reaction which ever got videotaped. Slit is being done. Okay, so what you can do here, more beautifully, you can do all other things what we discussed. Plus, we can do a lot of long read lengths. What else we can do? Essentially, if you look into this reaction, you are not following the synthesis of DNA. You are following the synthesis of DNA, but what else we are, you are following here? You are following the kinetics of polymerase. Right? Enzyme kinetics, anybody has KM, Vmax, uncompetitive, non-competitive? You have heard all this? Yes. So this is comes into picture. See, when you develop anything, you have to use all the knowledge from everywhere. You should know everything. When you are doing analysis, genomics, you should not say only genomics, I don't want to read other stuff. No, you should read as much as possible. You should be a voracious reader. Right? If you want to develop anything, do any research. Okay? So this is an enzyme kinetics we are following here. So what can we make use of that polymerase kinetics? How do we make use of that? Right? See, here is there is a polymerase kinetics, right? See, when you do the polymerase kinetics, you know the time interval of addition of the ATGC basis. Right? It takes so much amount of milliseconds, 1 milliseconds, 1.5 milliseconds to add ATGC. You can measure that during video taping. You can measure that. But now, it's a normal one. But now, if you're adding a base against a methylated adenine, suppose in bacteria, adenines are methylated even now in, in uh, Eukaryotes also, there are recent reports that adenine is methylated. Okay? There is a lag, there is a different, kinetics is different. Time point of adding a T there is different. The kinetics is different here. Kinetics of methylated bases is different. If you could measure adding the standard ones, that kinetics. Now, what we can do? We can now don't have to do bisulfide treatment or anything. Take that DNA, pass it through wherever you see differences in the kinetics of addition of that particular base. You know that there is a modification of that base. Now we know it's a methylated modification on cytosine, on adenine, right? It could be hydroxymethylation, we know. There could be many, many more. And there is a chance to detect that. If you are finding something completely novel, uh, Kinetics is going on, either more time or less time. You know that something that doesn't match with the methylated cytosine or methylated adenine. You know that it could be something different. Yeah. It seems that it's very important to show this in endothermal cycle. Yes, of course. It's an enzymatic reaction. You have to have the temperature. That's why this machine is big. It is very expensive, seven hundred thousand dollars. You have Peltiers. You are all Peltiers inside. You have the Peltiers inside. You have the modules where there is a temperature, typical temperature for the reaction. Yeah, everything. All the Illuminas ones, all, all, all the machines. You have Peltiers, they change the temperature. When, when you are doing the uh, amplification, you have to have the PCR conditions there. The temperature changes here. That's why these instruments make, uh, get expensive. But the sequence data, sequence data, sequencing is cheaper, but the machines are still very expensive. So this is what there is a definitely there is a real serious chance of detecting newer types of DNA modification. Right? Isn't it cool? If you use this technique, this is a very big advantage of this. Okay? And then there is one more technology called as nanopore technology. Okay? Which is coming up with DNA sequencing. I think that is a real future according to me. That means what? Entire different concept. Instead of using these cameras and this great, wonderful, entire different concept. What is a different concept? 
have you seen any pores? Have you seen in the sense I heard about pores in the biology? Cell membrane, it is full of pores. Aquapores, you know, it is there in the blood. The guy who de developed aquapores discovered he got Nobel Prize for that because people thought the water will just easily come and go through the membrane. He said, no, it's also regulated. No, aquaporins, right? There are pores on the cell membrane. There's a lipid bile there, so there is a lipid bilayer and there is a pore, there's a protein in that, there's a pore through that. The, the, the movement of the solutes, everything is highly regulated, right? So, you know. so the idea was, can we develop a synthetic nanopore using a lipid bilayer synthetically, okay? And then take a long DNA, push it through that aquapore, right? Like a thread. As it is coming out each nucleotide, somehow detect that nucleotide and then build the sequence. How do you like this idea? Right? You can pull 20, 30, 40, k, well, entire, entire chromosome also you can uh, pull it down. As long as you are detecting those, when it comes out that each nucleotide by nucleotide you have to detect it. Right? So, what you have to do? You have to build a uh, nanopore membrane, called chemistry now, nanopore, nanopore technology, how does the nanopores are, size of the pore, uniform size of the pore, how do you get that uniform size of the pore? How do you do all that? So get back, get into chemistry. Don't think of I'm specialization into genomics or informatics or I'm doing this only Linux or this, no. Just know everything and then try to see how, how I can use the entire information. Get into electrochemistry here, get into nanopore technology here and then see how I can make the uniform pore, what else I can do. Try to see in the biology, in the cell membrane level, in the biology, what kind of a molecules are there which we, I can use it to do, do, do that, right? So what people have done that to do that, people thought that we can use pore forming protein in the membrane. There are proteins are in the membrane, right? I want to select a membrane protein, which is a pore forming protein in the membrane. And that protein is so specific, so consistent, that it will create a pore of a consistent diameter. And then if you look into literature, you have two here, okay? Alpha hemocyanin is a structure in such a way there is a hole, literally there is a hole in that protein. You can embed that between the membrane, okay? Then another protein from the mycobacterium called as MSPA, it also can act as a pore, actually literally like this, like a barrel. Okay, and then you can put it in the bilayers bi and you can push it down. Okay, people initially thought using it as a lipid bilayer, then solid state, there are many people who worked on the solid state, no biological membranes using the silicon or graphene. You have heard of graphenes? They're carbon compounds, very tight, tough, but thin you can create. In that graphenes, you can embed this, these, these things, or you can ha have a hybrid between the lipids and graphenes, different techniques, different thinkings, ideas are being developed. How to develop that, the membrane, nanopore membrane. Synthetic and then getting inspiration from the biology, getting inspiration from the structural uh, chemistry in the nature, carbon chemistry, right? And then look for the proteins which can form pores. So these two proteins were detected. You know, people found out that these could be very good to start the membrane, okay? Isn't it cool idea? Good, excellent, right? Revolutionary, right? So how do we detect that now? Okay, we have the pores here. This is the membrane. We added this alpha hemocyanin here. It has a pore like this, right? So how do I now detect the sequence? How do I sequence based on this? Another idea was simple. What they did was they said, okay, now I have this lipid bilayer here and this is electrically neutral, right? Then I'll pass current from here to here, from across this membrane. When I pass current across this membrane, typically what happens in the biological systems, the current passes through these pores, not from anywhere else, right? When the current passes through these pores, when you're adding, when it passes like this, direct pore, it passes in a certain way. Right? When you add some molecule there,
create an obstacle there based on that charge and size of that molecule, the current passage changes. And this passage is not random, it is specific for that particular particular molecule. Right? That molecule could be benzene, that molecule could be anything, whatever you think of, or that molecule can be a nucleotide. Right? And those nucleotides are not same, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, their charges are different and their sizes are different. So when you are passing these through different molecule, this molecule is not going inside, there is like <laughs> very little current is going, but they are passing through this, but and then current is different, the flow of current changes, right? And if you could detect the flow of this current, like these signals, and you standardize that for A, T, G, C, there's a specific flow of current is there, pattern is there. And then when you pass the DNA through this, and, and when A is passing, you get one particular signal of current. If G is passing, you get another signal. T, another signal. C, another signal. As it starts passing, you get different signals of the current passage, patterns of the current passage. You start building the sequence. No fluorescence here, nothing. Isn't it cool? Beautiful? Let's do it. Right? Let's do it. And that's exactly we started working on this. Right? So this is what I explained. Whatever I told you, it is explained here for you guys to read. Because I did not put this because I didn't want to read, but I explained to you and then you can read later. Okay? So this is the hemocyanin. If you get into this little bit of details, not too much, just to give you some concept. This is the DNA. Now pass it through this, what do you do? Either you can add a polymerase here to pass it through, or you can as add a helicase here, you know, like a zipper type helicase, different proteins which can unzip, zip. If you add the helicase here, you can have your own ingenious ideas how to do that. You know, This should be a motor protein. When you put that zip, it should unzip and you should push it through this. You should put the enzyme in such a way that you add that. Or you can add a exonuclease here, and then you can cut one base at a time, tip, 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 like a drop of water, you can add one, one base at a time. You can think whatever you would like to do, how you would like to develop, right? You want to start a, start a company, you can start doing these experiments, starting a business plan, okay? So what is it? There are different ways, what kind of a protein you put it here, you can add a polymerase here, polymerase can push, add in DNA, or you can add a helicase here, or you can add a exonuclease here, you can cut that DNA and then keep putting one base at a time. So when we do this, what is important is that, see the, when the, we are pushing this, somewhere along, we have again slow down the movement of the, this one, molecule. So they created some kind of a mutation, the chemical modifications here, where it slows down in this region, movement of the strand. When it slows down, slowly movement of the strand, you get a time, I know it, it takes, you know, the pattern of that electric flow is, is it persists for some, some amount of time so that you can record that, okay? So if you create that, make it slower, then you can, when it passes through, you can detect these changes in the signal, okay? So it is very simple then. See, like this, see, it passes in passing through this, there's a molecule here, the electricity is changing here, it is coming through the side. An example I showed. You can do methylated DNAs, methylated nucleotides, normal ones, whatever. Okay, there's no camera here, nothing, no big ones, machines, right? You can make it small, make cheaper, faster. You can quickly do as long, as much as possible length. Literally, you can pass the entire chromosome through that. So that is the future technology. How big is that instrument? You have seen the Illumina one, it is like this big, this big. Um, pack bio from there to here, huge, huge machines. You can't move. So three, four people have to you know, move from one bench to another bench, huge, big. How big is this? This big, this big. How big is this? You have to pass through the entire DNA. Even if you're passing the chromosomal DNA, it should be huge, right? It should be big, right? So if you look at the size, how do you, 
How do you hold that? So this is another slide I'm showing you. This is a different normal one, <coughs> methylated one, hydroxymethylated one also can stay here and then give the different patterns of the current. This is how it looks. This is the entire machine. You can keep it in your pocket. I can go and sequence. You can sequence several KBs of DNA, and this is the uh, cartoon, how it works. You have an enzyme here, or helicase, or it could be a exonuclease. This is the uh, membrane here, and this is the pore. And then you can pass this to this pore, right? So that is where we are moving to into sequencing technologies. As we move, as we make these changes, similarly, all the computation will also change. Analysis will also change. Basic concepts will re re remain the same, but the other things will, will change. Entire field will change. Right? Fascinating? OK, imagine that we, are, we did all that. We are sequencing the whole thing. What else? Imagine this is all done. Everything is done. So what do we do? That's it. Done. Nothing else is um, remains to be discovered or invented or we are happy. You're all happy? Good. So in the next class, I shouldn't teach anything more. <laughs> Repeat the same thing. Right? Or no summer school. <laughs> right? So imagine, think. What you can do? Now I have the human genome. Now I have a Mendelian disorder, cystic fibrosis. Shall I discover that and then clap and then watch that person suffering? Shall I? Right? Or people say, oh, we'll develop drugs, chemicals, side effect, problems, live with that. Sometimes there won't be any cure. They're only management, right? If I want to understand the uh, functioning of the genome or philosophically molecular evolution, what makes human beings humans, bacteria, human beings, plants, chimps, how do you want to study? Sequencing is good enough? That's all? It can, does it answer, do you think it can answer all the questions in the world, in biological field, or it can solve all our problems? It can detect, it can tell what is wrong, but can it correct it? Right? So we need to correct. That means that can we move from sequencing into correcting that sequence? Can we make changes in that sequence? Right? Nature does that. If you stand in the, in the, the summer time outside, you get time and dimers because of the UV. They're, they're all random things, bad guys, bad things. If you smoke, there are changes in the genome, right? But we don't want those kind of changes. We want corrective changes, better changes, good changes, right? Can we do that? That means, can we engineer the genome? Or can we edit the genome? Have you heard these names, right? Can we do that? Yes, we can do. Why not? If you could sequence, we can also bring in changes there. So if you historically, if you see who made the changes, you heard of in the 80s, this change was made first time. You heard of knockout mice? Right? Sequencing technology, Sanger type disease. This is as if I equate with the Sanger, this is a knockout mice. It was a big revolution. It won Nobel Prize. Right? But it used to take one to two years to knock out one mice, get one knockout mice, one gene. It was good to study, you know, knock it out, and see the effects. Beautiful, wonderful work. Then what happened? People said, I can knock down its expression. RNAi came, right? RNAi used to knock down the expression of the gene. You knock out of a gene or knock down the expression of the gene, right? But like sequencing, it was like a Sanger sequencing, one gene at a time, one transcriptome at a time. So knock down one transcriptome at a time, transcriptome at a time, right? One gene at a time. But the idea is when you're sequencing genome-wide level, can we do editing genome-wide level too? Think big, right? Can we do that? So that is how, again, some people started thinking in those. 
can we carry out targeted editing of the genome? In other words, can we engineer genome? Right? So what we can do, engineering genome? For genetic engineering, we had earlier in 70s, 80s, can we move to genome engineering now? Like a sequencing from one gene to one genome, can we engineer instead of one gene to one genome? Genetic engineering gave us recombinant insulin. It gave the uh, recombinant, there were several proteins which are used in medicine, in treatment, right? Can we now edit the genome, right? So what is the idea of editing the genome, right? Why we want to do this? To create a new species? No, right? We are working to derive benefits from that. What? You can do gene knockout, one gene knockout, yes. It takes two years now, conventional one. Can we do it in a yeah, few days, a month, faster? Can we knock out uh, large-scale genome knockout? Some pathways can we knock out? Several genes or pathway can we knock out? Isn't it a great idea? It's a revolutionary idea thinking, right? Beyond sequencing, genome sequencing, this is, this is beyond genome sequencing, right? Or can we activate the genes? Nobody heard about this. Can we activate the genes? Right? We have the compounds, we add compounds to activate the genes, but really targeted activation. Or can we activate pathways instead of genes? <coughs> right? So can we control expression of genes or pathways? Can we control that? We know we can study it is making more or less. Can we make it now in increase expression, reduce expression, not express? Right? Again, instead of knocking out gene, can we knock out pathways or again substrate? I said, knock out non-coding RNA genes. We are knocking out only known genes coding. Can we knock out non-coding RNAs? Because majority of the DNA, which is 98% or 98.5%, they call it junk DNA. It's really junk. According to ENCODE, they say that 70 to 80% of the hu human genome is biochemically active. Right? So there are RNAs which are transcribed n number of places which don't code for the protein. They could be uh, associated with the structure. They may have structural and regulatory functions. No way, we, we don't have any other way to knock them down because <coughs> if you want to knock it down, it should be in the cytoplasm. RNAi may not work, we don't know. So what we can do? Can we do that, doing the genome editing, <coughs> right? Synthetic biology, can we configure new metabolic pathways, you know? different pathway enzymes, you can activate different enzymes, okay, and then create a new metabolic pathway to get a new metabolite, right? So can we do that? Do you think we can do this? Right? So the things were developed, genome editing, after, path, after, after knockout, people thought that we should do, can do much better than taking two years to knock out a mice. And then have you anybody heard of, um, that, that requires, what it requires is knockout type. You have to somehow take a DNA, DNA's enzyme, which can cut the DNA. It can create a double standard break in the DNA. And then take that enzyme to a specific site on the genome and ask you to cut there, right? When you cut it there, rest everything cell takes care. When there is a genome cut is there, cell wants to repair that cut, damage to the DNA. It has two ways to do that. One is non-homologous end joining. That means that just j tries to join the end. To do that, it first does it chops the DNA off, eats the DNA a little bit, and then joins it. While doing that, it makes errors. And select the errors which has errors here, and then those are the mutated cells. Or it can do the homologous end joining, which is accurately corrects that. That also you can use that to insert some new gene. So how do you home in an endonuclease at a particular site, right? So you can go through this. I am not getting into details of that. I'll discuss one which is very popular. There are called as the uh, zinc finger nucleases are there. You can read about that. Thallin nucleases are there. You can lear learn about that. But we will just go through briefly for 10 minutes about a new technology called CRISPR-Cas9 and see whether it can do all this in coming years, okay? Have you, anybody of you heard about CRISPR-Cas9? 
many of you, yes, this is very popular that shows. How many of you exactly know the mechanism, how it was developed? Very <laughs> few, okay. Excellent. So we'll discuss, exactly we'll discuss about that. Okay? Before we go, any technology, we have to derive it from the biological system. It is going on somewhere in the biology in some organism. And we have to adapt it to our advantage. Right? So exactly the CRISPR happens in bacteria. In 1980s, 88 or 89 sometimes, people discovered in the bacterial genome, there are some repeat sequences are there, they are very curious. There are some nucleases are there, endonucleases in the bacterial genome. And then in front of that endonucleases, they found some repeat sequences. Curious, no idea why. That's how slowly it developed. Okay? Then they found out the entire story revealed in the two, uh, by 2008 or 9 until then. I'm summarizing the whole story, otherwise it will take its own different class. What happens is that when a virus or something infects to the cell, it releases its DNA, then the bacteria activates some of these enzymes. The pathway is known, but more details are still being investigated, okay? It chops that DNA out and it integrates that in its own host in front of these endonucleases, okay? And then you have this different viral or plasmid DNA. It keeps bank. It keeps, you know, creates a bank of this foreign invading DNA. Isn't it smart? We think bacteria doesn't have brain, but you know, it's very smart. Right? And then in between these two, it, it keeps a repetitive sequence. Okay? There's CRISPR RNA, we'll call it. This is called as a spacer RNA. Okay? This is a spacer RNA. There is a specific RNA repeat RNA, specific RNA, repeat RNA, specific RNA, uh, not sorry, specific DNA, repeat DNA, right? The specific DNAs are from the investing in invading hosts. They could be viruses or plasmids. So that's how it creates the bank. So next time when the virus invades, right? That time what happens is that it transcribes these genes. And then when it transcribes in genes, it, it, and from this, it breaks, chops this into small pieces like this. It is a part of the specific gene and the repeat gene, okay? And there is another gene here. It al this also gets transcribed. This has homology with this repeat sequence. Are you able to understand? Looks little complicated, but it's very easy, very simple. When you get this, this gene, this is the specific gene for the virus, and then you have this repeat gene this tracer RNA has a homology with this repeat sequence, that black protein here. All this complex binds to this protein called Cas9. It's an endonuclease, otherwise it is inactive. Okay? When it binds with this, it becomes active. And because this is specific for the viral genome or the plasmid genome, and then it goes and binds to that particular viral genome through this enzyme. Right? And the enzyme is active, and then it chops out that viral genome, breaks that viral genome, like this. It binds it here, it creates a double-stranded break, it breaks the viral genome at different places. This is called as adaptive immunity in bacteria, prokaryotic adaptive immunity. Immunity is not only in human beings or in eukaryotes, it's there right in bacteria too. They adapt to the invasions, and then they start defending themselves through their own genome. You got the concept through these slides? Right? Adaptive immunology. So there are two RNAs here, right? They, it cuts it here. Now, the smartness is 2012, the paper came, they said that can we use it instead of take this out, take this Cas9 out, understand the structure of this everything sequence. And then, this is the speak viral sequence is here. Can I put a sequence from the human genome, particular gene, right? And then put it in the human cells. And it should do this job, right? So to do that, ag again, that exactly was, was thought, right? This is the DNA, this is the 20 nucleotide is the area, this is the PAM size called as protospator activator uh, motif. This is called as you need this particular NGG sequence for this to activate because all this biochemistry 
the things which are necessary for the enzyme activity were discovered. It's a long process of work, you know, almost one and a half to two decades of work by different people, right? What is this PAM, discovery of this PAM, discovery of this tracer RNA here, which binds here, discovery of that uh, CRISPR RNA, and then you have the 20 nucleotides of that specific uh, protein, or specific nucleotides for the, for the virus or plasmids, right? So this is how it is, whole thing, right? So how do we adopt that into our to chopping off or cutting, binding this to the human genome? Right? This was known. The, the smartness of the, I think Jennifer Dudna and then Dr. Carpenter from, from Europe, what they thought was, now these two RNAs, putting those two RNAs is a complicated stuff, whole thing. It will, in RNAs, it degrades and it's a problem. What they thought was, why can't we join these, these two RNAs by a few nucleotides? Naturally, in bacteria, they are separated by the different loci, different genes they are transcribed. And they come together into by, by this enzyme. And then putting this together, bring, uh, bringing them exactly the same place, it's a little bit complicated inside the cell and making these two RNA becomes a little bit complicated. So that simple idea was, can I create an RNA, because there's two RNAs, can I join them by few nucleotides here? Simple, right? They exactly did that. And then they put a, they, they, that, and they called, and then they take, took this, and then they took this 20 nucleotide of the specific region of the gene, exact specific region. Then they took the Cas9 gene on a promoter, overexpressing promoter, right? PCDNA, you know, you have heard about the, all these? expressing vectors, viral vectors, retroviral vectors, lentiviral vectors, right? Put it on this vector, express this Cas9, suppose a HeLa cell. Those HeLa cells are expressing Cas9, right? On the same cassette of the plasmid or different plasmid, you put this gene which has this fusion between the nucleotides of the specific region of the, of the DNA of the genome and this particular sequence which is very well known. From the bacteria, you deri derived it. You added a few more nucleotides here, which creates that kind of a loop there. OK? Because if, if, it, if it, do it matches somewhere here, then you don't get the loop like this. So it collapses. When you add into this now cell, and it should do what it was doing in bacteria. There is no difference between the cell is a cell. It's a, it, it, these molecules don't rec recognize it's a bacterial cell. I should work. It's a human cell. Doesn't I shouldn't work here. No, it doesn't work like that. So it should be in a position to cut it. Once it is cut, our job is done. Right? That's exactly. This is what it is. It cuts. When it cuts, then you have this cut DNA, because it is guiding this RNA is guiding to go to a specific region of the genome which you are targeting. That's why it's called as a guide RNA terminology. Okay, they give new terminology to this. It's a synthetic RNA, it doesn't exist naturally. They call it guide RNA, you add that, express Cas9, it goes and binds here, makes the double standard cut. When it makes a double standard cut, in most of the time, because it is creating on one chromosome, your another chromosome is intact in the cell, that chromosome is DNA was is used by the cell as a template, and then it does a homologous recombination there, and then it corrects it accurately. This is cell prefers this. In some cases, cell directly joins this without homologous recombination. This is the thing, non-homologous uh, region, that creates mutations. It does mistakes. Not in all cells. If you do million cells out of a million, maybe 100 cells do the mistake, 20 cells. If your frequency is more, it creates mistakes. Then you have to select the cells where the mistake has happened. You have to do NGF, again, do the sequencing, and, and select the cells which have these mutations. Right? <coughs> In the knockout, you are knocking out one cell. What else we can do with this? Right? What else we can do? Either, either when you do this, either it can be a wild type, it can be an insertion, it can be a deletion, or it can be a frame sheet mutation in that RNA, and you can knock it out. But also you can do, you can target it here, you can target it here. You can have two guide RNAs and then slice this region out, right? You can do that or 
you can remove the endonuclease activity from the Cas9. Now you can think whatever you want to think. Remove the endonuclease activity. You put a transcription factor, fuse it. And then guide it to the region where the DNA is inactive. G there is no transcription going on. We go then binds there to that region like this. Transcription factor starts transcribing, activating the gene. Simultaneously, you can do 1, 2, 10, 20 genes, or you can entire pathway you can activate, or entire pathway you can inactivate. Or you can create a library like this, or entire genome, all 10,000 genes library you can create. You can transfect that whole thing SHRNA library type into inside the cells, and look for the cells with particular phenotype to discover which ge gene is responsible, what type. For example, you take I'm just telling out of my you know, idea, some, some you know, random idea. So you take a stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell, and then start differentiating it. Along with the differentiation, you, uh, you transfect it with the library from this um, uh, CRISPR library. You have every cell has a library, each one, each gene is knocked out, different places. And then see which one is differentiated, which one is not differentiated. You can isolate, you can discover that way genes which are necessary for the differentiation into particular lineage. Right? Or you can knock down the pathways. You can do n number of different things. Or you can modify this instead of binding to DNA, it can bind to RNA. Knock down this, or you can bind to RNA, and then instead of transcription factor, put the G, uh, uh, GFP here. Now you can track movement of that RNA in the cell for research. right? Or you can put it on a particular gene in the genome and then see where that gene is going when it is expressed. For example, GATA1, our favorite. You take it, it's not expressed in the, uh, the hematopoietic stem cells. When you take it to uh, erythroid uh, uh, pathway, the GATA1 is activated. right? Where that locus, the idea was that, hypothesis was that this locus goes to the uh, some region of the nucleus where the chromatin is open, some region of the nucleus which chromatin is inactive. That's hypothesis. You can tag it there and see where that, where that GATA locus is moving in the nucleus. You can try to exactly understand how this genome, genome is dynamic, it's not static, moves around the nucleus during active and inactive conditions. Just give you one random example, just now I just as I thought of that. Right? You can do the n number of possibilities. That's why there is a lot of excitement on, on this these days. You can see paper in every every nature science cell every month you get one paper on this. And then Cas9, you have that uh, PAM, right? Then you have to make it more specific. Specificity is a problem. You have to work on that everything. Like a, you know, next generation sequencing, there are drawbacks. You are working on those drawbacks. You can work on that. You can create a synthetic biology for new chemical compounds. So that is the future. Right? So what else we have? This is what we can do. This is how it looks. It's a cartoon. I like this. It's a good cartoon. So this is the Cas9. We can bind. It is moving around everywhere. Whenever he, he, it looks, comes across the specific DNA, it cuts. Right? We can go through this. And then, thank you. I think we are end of our time. Right? Thanks. Enjoy our lunch. <laughs>